When kingship was brought down to heaven, chapter 5, cities, urban centers of population are a hallmark of advanced civilization. The Sumerian tablet that relates the tale of the first five cities on earth is thus the record of the start of advanced civilizations on earth. Cities imply specialization between farming and industry, have buildings and streets and marketplaces, develop commerce and trade, entail transportation and communications, need record-keeping, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They also require an organized society and laws. They have an administrative hierarchy, appoint or, or anoint a chief executive. In Samir and thereafter virtually everywhere else, that was a Lugal, literally a big man, rendered king in translation. The Sumerians denoted these elements of advanced knowledge and the sum total of civilization in the term Nam Lugal La, a term usually translated kingship. And kingship, the Sumerians asserted, was brought down to earth from the heavens. Held to be a divine institution, kingship required that the king, to be legitimate, had to be chosen or actually anointed by the gods. Accordingly, throughout the ancient world, the succession of kings was meticulously recorded in king lists. In Egypt, as we have seen, they were arranged by dynasties. In Babylonia and Assyria, in Elam and and Hatti, in Persia and beyond, and in the Bible with its two book of kings, the king lists name successive rulers, giving their lengths of reign and occasionally a brief biographical note. In Sumer, where kings ruled in numerous city-states, the main list was arranged by the royal cities that served as a land's central or national capital at any given time, a function that rotated from one major city to another. And Sumer's most famous and best-preserved king list begins with the statement, quote, when kingship was brought down from heaven, a statement that matches the opening verses of the tale of the pre-diluvial cities of the gods that we have just quoted. After the blank of kingship was brought down from heaven, and after the lofty crown and throne of kingship were lowered from heaven. Those assertions, it should be clear, were not meant just to enshrine kingship with divine status. A fundamental tenet of Sumerian history and teachings was that kingship was actually, and not just figuratively, brought down to earth from the heavens. That the Anunnaki, those who from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth came, actually began their civilized presence on earth in five settlements, as stated in tablet CBS 10673. Though the name of the God who made the grants is missing in that tablet, One can say with certainty that it was Enlil who followed Enki in coming to earth, a detail recognized by the statement that the first of these cities, Eridu, to the leader New Dimid, who was also Ea or Enki, was given. Furthermore, each one of the others who were granted a city, New Gig, the moon god, Nanar Sin, Pablasog, who is also Ninurta, Utu, who was Shamash, and Sud, the medic, Ninma, was not just a high-ranking member of the Sumerian pantheon, but was related to Enlil. It was after Enlil's arrival that Inki's initial outpost, Eridu, was expanded to five, then eight full-fledged settlements. The connection between those first of cities of, of the gods and the bringing down of civilization to earth from the heavens is restated in several other Sumerian documents, dealing with pre-diluvial events. Two of the key documents can be seen by anyone who visits the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford, England, a museum that traces its beginning to the donation in 1683 by Elias Ashmole of 12 cartloads of antiquarian collectibles that the official history of the museum describes as a Noah's Ark of rarities. The original collection diversified and grew over the centuries to become an official institution of the University of Oxford. Throngs do not wait in line to enter it. It has no Mona Lisa to attract multitudes or movie makers, but among the objects that it houses are two priceless archaeological finds 
of utmost importance to the history of mankind and our planet. And birth record the deluge, alias Noah's flood, cataloged as WB62 and WB444 by Stephen Langdon in Oxford editions of Cuneiform Text, 1923. The two clay Sumerian artifacts belong to the private collection that Herbert Weld Blundell, an English journalist, explorer, and archaeologist, donated to the museum in 1923. WB444 is better known as the better known of the two, while WB62 looks like the usual kind of clay tablet. WB444 is a rare, remarkable, and beautiful four-sided prism of baked clay. Known as the Sumerian king list, it details how Sumer's capital was first in the city of Kish, then moved to Uruk and to Ur, and then changed to Awan, returned to Kish, transferred to Hamazi, returned to Uruk, and then to Ur, and so on, ending in the city called Isin. The last entry dates the document to a king named Utu Hegel, who reigned in Uruk circa 2120 B.C., more than 4,100 years ago. But those kings, the prism text clearly states, began to reign only after the deluge when kingship was lowered again from heaven. The initial portion of the prism lists kings in five pre-diluvial cities of the gods, assigning to each ruler links of reign that baffle scholars. This is what it says. Nam Lugal. When kingship from heaven was lowered. Irida Ki Nam Lugala in Eridu was kingship. Irida Ki Alum Lim Lagal in Eridu Alum was king. MU 28, uh, 28,800 IA. 28,800 years ago he reigned. Al- Algar, 36,000 years reigned. Lugal, two kings. It's 64,800 years reigned. I mean, this is all pre-flood. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years of reign of these gods before the Great Deluge. And see, this is becoming clearer and clearer to me what this whole rock wall thing is. This is one of, this is one of the cities that, that was reigned over before the, uh, before the flood happened. And continued in translation only, Eridu was dropped, kingship to Bad Tibiara was carried. In Bad Tibiara, Inme in Lu Anna reigned 43,200 years. Inme Engal Anna reigned 28,800 years. Demuzi, a shepherd, reigned 36,000 years. Three kings reigned a total of 108,000 years. Bad TBR was dropped. Kingship to Larak was carried. And Larak in Sapanzi Anna reigned 28,800 years. One king reigned its 28,800 years. Larak was dropped. Kingship to Sapar was carried. And Sapar in May Indura Anna became king and reigned for 21,000 years. Sipar was destroyed. Its kingship to Shiparak was carried. In Chupark, Ubar Tutu became king and reigned its 18,600 years. Five cities they were, eight kings reigned 241,200 years. The flood swept there over. So they had eight kings in five cities that reigned for 241,200 years before the great flood, the deluge. No wonder, no wonder scholars are baffled by that text. Hello? See, this, this gives me a greater understanding of what it is that we're looking at here. Because everybody's, you know, that's always been the question about the Rockwell thing to me. Is, it, is that, you know, there seems to be, you know, a connection to these Anunnaki types. But also the evidence shows that this was all ha- happening and all built before the Great Flood. So... I think there's been questions as to whether or not the Anunnaki were around on Earth before the Great Flood. I think the common widely held belief is that they were not, 
But, uh, well, according to this, they indeed were. And they, the, the, the survivors and the remnants of that are the ones that set up the rest of their, uh, you know, it's, that, that, it, it makes me wonder, you know, the rock wall being on the 33rd degree parallel. They say when that, after the flood, it first, you know, boom, it, was, it came to life there in Samir. That was the first city that was erected after the great flood. And, you know, with, um, just I can't help but wonder and think that if the rock wall, specifically being built on the 33rd degree parallel, was one of the cities that was reigned over for 241,200 years, as it says here, and as, as it says in this uh, text that's in the museum at Oxford that was donated by this guy in 1923, that it would make complete and utter sense, ladies and gentlemen, that the remnant of that civilization who had to flee their, their lands and flee their uh, cities because of the Great Flood, it makes complete and utter sense that they would rebuild their new civilization and their new society after the Flood, where smack dab on the 33rd degree parallel yet again, in ancient Sumeria. I mean, it says in the Sumerian text that before they came to Earth, they came, they went to Mars, right? Remember? They set up shop with the Agigi there. They even had a burial in one of the caves of, uh, and one of the, and even one of the Sumerian texts, I mean, uh, talks about, you know, them etching this guy's face in the mountain. Uh, Mars was the way station. And the place on Mars where, uh, they found these, you know, these pyramid objects and the supposed face on Mars, which is called Cydonia, is also on the 33rd degree parallel. And subsequently, the ancient name for that area of Mesopotamia and Iraq and Samir was called Cydonia as well. And it was smack dab on the 33rd degree parallel. I mean, I knew there had to have been a connection to why, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I talked about this on the show, you know, with this the quarry and down there at Lake Buchanan and all that and Berger Hill and that whole thing that I found. Why didn't, if they, if they, if there was nothing special about this building, why didn't they just build it right close to where they had the material, which is uh, about four hours away? Because four hours away was not on the 33rd degree parallel. So they brought these stones four hours away, mixed them into the mortar in, in the style that they needed with the right uh, proportions created this massive rock wall structure. And then when the flood came and they packed up shop and had to leave all that behind, they flew through the air on a direct line on the 33rd degree parallel, which you can navigate all the way around the earth on. And guess what else is on the 33rd degree parallel? Roswell. And it's been speculated that that's why you have so many UFO sightings along the 33rd degree parallel, because they're flying around the Earth at that, at that degree. I mean, is this why 33 is so significant and special to the Masons? I mean, I absolutely think that that's the entire reason. They just packed up shop and they moved to the first location they found on the next 33rd degree parallel that looked good. The usual rendering of WB444's first lines is misleading in one key respect. In the original clay document, the numbers of the lengths of reigns are given in SAR units using the numerical, numerical sign for 3,600. Alumun's reign in Eridu is not stated 28,800 years, but it's listed as eight shards, or sars here. Alaugar's reign was not 36,000 years, but 10 sars, and so on down the list of pre-diluvial rulers. The sar units in this prism are the very saros of Barosis. Significantly, the SAR unit of rain applied only to the pre-diluvial rulers of the cities of the gods. 
the unit of count changes to regular numbers in the post-diluvial part of the document. No less significant is the fact that this list of rulers names the very same first five cities in the exact same order as does tablet CBS 10673. But rather than naming the gods whose cult center each city was, WB4444 lists the king's administrators of each such city. As a major study by William W. Hallow, the antediluvian cities was was established has established both documents, records, and a canonical a uh, canonical tradition of regarding the start of civilization kingship on Earth, beginning in Eridu and ending in Shuparak at the Deluge time. One cannot fail to note that WB444 does not mention the hero of the Deluge, Zisudra, among the eight kings it names. Embracing the cities and reigns from the start in Eridu to the diluvial finale in Shirapak, its list ends with Ubar Tutu and not with Zisudra. But as Tablet 6, I'm sorry, Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh clearly stated the hero of the Deluge. Zisudra was the last ruler of Shirupak, and he was the son and successor of Ubar Tutu. Various discoveries of other complete or fragmented similar tablets leave no doubt that a canonized text from which copies and copies of copies were made did exist in regard to the pre-diluvial cities of the gods and their rulers. And in the course of such copying, errors and omissions took place, one such little-known tablet is kept in a private collection in the Carpelli's Manuscript Library in Santa Barbara, California. It, too, names eight kings in five cities, but its different reign links add up to ten great sars, which equals only 22,600 years. Oh, only 22,000 years. So only 22,000 years as opposed to 241,000 years. Oh, it's off a little bit. (laughs) My God, you're still talking about somebody who ruled here for 200,000 plus years. You know, give or take uh, 20 or 40,000 years here or there. Okay, why is that a big deal? The glaring omissions of Zisidra are corrected in another tablet called by some scholars the Dynastic Chronicle. It lists nine Kings in the first five cities, again, with somewhat different SAR numbers, but correctly ending with two kings in Shirupak, Ubartutu and Zisudra. The tablet adds, after the total of five cities, nine kings, 98 SARs, which equals 352,800 years. A brief explanation for the deluge and Lil took a, ma- a dislike to mankind. The clamor they made kept kept him sleepless. The tablet that gives the most accurate list of ten rulers matching the Barosis list is the Ashmolean Museum's tablet WB62. Its SAR units for the pre-diluvial list parallel the, Sor- the Soros units of Barosis, though with different individual rain periods. It differs from WB444 in listing not five but six cities adding the city of Larsa, and with it two rulers to the pre-diluvial list, resulting in the full ten rulers, and ending correctly with Zisudra at deluge time. A comparison of WB62 with the Greek fragments of Barosis points strongly to this version as his principal source. Which of the various tablets that we have reviewed is the most accurate? The one that ends in Shurupak and concludes Zisudra and his father predecessor is possibly the most reliable with them. The list has 10 pre-diluvial rulers in six cities of the gods. The Bible, too, lists 10 pre-diluvial patriarchs, though all were descendants of Adam through his grandson, Enosh, which is Hebrew for human, and not considered gods. The fact that they numbered 10 and that the hero of the del- the hero of the deluge Noah was like Zesudra the tenth adds support to the ten rulers count as the correct one. 
Despite the varying individual rain links, the various tablets unanimously agree that those successive rulers reigned from the kingship that was brought down from heaven until the deluge swept o- swept there over. Oh, my goodness. See, that makes so much sense now. So, so this kingship was brought down to heaven, to earth, until the deluge swept over. And what happened after the deluge swept over? Well, then it wasn't seen as being handed down from heaven anymore. And I believe that it's at this point when the bloodlines started to have significance um, as far as the, you know, quote-unquote divine right to rule and this passing down of hereditary dictatorships. Because after the deluge, as it states here, this quote-unquote brought down from uh, from heaven was wiped out. Because, again, as we talked about in other readings of Sitchin we've done in the past and other uh, stuff that we've read here, um, you know, they, they later on, Anu was like, you know, what's what's going on with this? How come some of these survived, you know? And then he agreed to, you know, let them live after that, after so many of them survived. Assuming that Barossus had reported the most reliable version, we also end up with his total of 120 shards, which is 432,000 years, as the correct combined total of the pre-diluvial reigns. The time that had passed from when kingship was brought down from heaven until the deluge. Thus, if we could determine when the deluge had occurred, we would obtain the date when the Anunnaki had arrived on earth. Is that right? So if we obtain the date, When the deluge had occurred, well, maybe we'll find that out before it's over with. Shit, some of this evidence may be in the rock wall thing. I mean, we've got the shale deposits there. We can date for a fact when this stuff started layering on top of this. I'll get us pretty close to a damn date. You watch. We get a dig going, I'll get a date for sure. That the number 120 appears in the biblical preamble to the tale of the deluge, the deluge might thus be more than a coincidence. The usual explanation that it represents a limit on human longevity set by God at the time of the deluge is a dubious explanation in view of the fact that the Bible itself reports right thereafter that Shem, the eldest son of Noah, lived after the deluge to the age of 600 years. His son, Arpachanshad, to 438, then Shellac to 433 years, and so on in descending longevities to 205 years for Terah, the father of Abraham, and Abraham himself lived to age 175. Moreover, a careful reading of of Hebrew shows that Genesis 6-3 states, and his years were 120. were, not will be, and his can be understood as referring to the deity's count in Sar years of his own presence on earth from arrival to deluge. In earthly years, that would be 432,000, a statement matching the 10 kings of 120 shards of Barossus and the Sumerian king list. Such a recollection of a pre-diluvial era of the gods can explain the fact that the number 432,000 has been associated with divine duration in varied cultures well beyond the boundaries of Mesopotamia. It forms, for example, the core of Hindu traditions about the ages of the yugas of earth, mankind, and the gods. The Kata Yuga, the great yuga of 4,320,000 years, was divided into four yugas, whose diminishing links were expressions of 432,000 years. The golden fourfold age, 432,000 times four. The threefold age of knowledge, 432,000 times three. The twofold age of sacrifice, 432,000 times two. And finally, our own present era, the age of discord. 
432,000 times 1. According to the Egyptian priest Mantheo, the duration of the world was 2,160,000 years. That equals five eras of 432,000, or 500 Shar years, 3,600 years times 500, which is 2,160,000. Let me get a drink real quick. The day of the Lord Brahma of 4 million, 4 billion, 320 million years equaled 1,000 great yugas, reminding one of the biblical statement that in the eyes of a god, a thousand years are just as one day. In Hamlet's Mill, 1977, professors Giorgio de Santilla and Hertha von Deschen cite additional instances of 432,000 serving as the point where myth and science join up. Modern scientific discoveries that have been presented in detail in Genesis Revisited and Divine Encounters had led me to conclude that the Great Flood was a huge tidal wave caused by the slippage of the ice sheet off Antarctica. The elimination of that ice box, I have suggested, caused the abrupt end of the last ice age circa 13,000 years ago. The continent of Antarctica was discovered only in 1820, yet it was already shown on the 1513 map of the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis as described in Divine Encounters. The slippage also explains the puzzle of other prediscovery mappus mundi, such as the 1531 Arantis Phineas map that shows Antarctica as though seen from the air and ice-free. The contours of the Antarctic continent under the ice cover were determined by radar and other modern means only in 1958. The abrupt end of the last ice age has been the subject of numerous studies, including an intensive investigation during the 1958 International Geophysical Year. The studies confirmed both the abruptness and timing about 13,000 years ago of the Ice Age's ending in Antarctica, but left unexplained the reasons for the phenomenon. Additional recent studies support those conclusions. A study of ancient temperatures determined that while warming at the end of the last Ice Age was relatively gradual in Greenland, it was rapid and abrupt in Antarctica about 13,000 years ago. Another study of ancient sea levels confirming that Antarctica's ice sheet collapsed abruptly, concluded that due to the topography of the continent and its surrounding seabeds, the tidal wave was at least three times higher than heretofore calculated, reaching its maximum impact some 2,000 miles away. A diagram accompanying the article shows the area of maximal tidal impact stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea and northeast therefrom, the very lands of the Bible, all the way to Mount Ararat. A deluge date circa 13,000 years ago, at about 10,950 B.C., also dovetails with statements in cuneiform texts that the deluge occurred in the age of the lion, that zodiacal age indeed began circa 11,000 B.C., Adding 432,000 plus 13,000, we can thus confidently say that kingship was brought down to earth from the heavens roughly 445,000 years ago. Now that's interesting because we've seen a lot of numbers pertaining to 500,000 years ago on the rock wall and that kind of thing. It was then that astronauts from another planet whom the Sumerians called Anunnaki arrived on earth They were the biblical Anakim and the Nephilim of Genesis 6. The various lists of pre-diluvial rulers unanimously agree that Eridu was the first city on earth. The name Eridu literally means house in the faraway built. It is a word that has taken root in many languages throughout the ages to denote earth itself. 
Earth is also called Erde in German, from Erde in Old High German. Jorda in Icelandic, Jord in Danish, Ertha in Gothic, Erthe in Middle English. It was called Ereds in Aramaic, Ertz in Kurdish, and to this day, Eretz in Hebrew. It is also important to remember that the various lists of reigns in the initial cities of the gods are lists of their successive chief officers and not the names of the gods to whom those cities were granted as cult centers. All the lists agree that Alulam and Alagar were the first rulers in the first city, which was Eridu, but as is clearly stated in the tablet CBS 10673, Eridu was forever granted to Nudit Mumud as an epitaph of Ia Inki that meant he who fashions artifacts. It remained his cult center forever, no matter who was the chief administrator there. Likewise, Sapar forever remained the cult center of the god Utu, better known by his Akkadian name Shamash. Various texts link the establishment of Eridu to the arrival of the Anunnaki on earth, when kingship was brought down from heaven. Just as NASA's first astronauts splashed down in the ocean in their command modules before landing facilities for spacecraft were developed, so did the first group of Anunnaki who came to Earth. They splashed down in the lower sea and dressed in wetsuits resembling fishmen. They waded ashore to establish a home away from home, Eridu, at the edge of the marshlands, a delta formed by the twin-like Tigris and Euphrates rivers as they flow through the Gulf. Now, see, he's confusing things here. There's another example of him. Now, this is where I would have gotten confused on this in the past, but now that I know what I know, I don't get confused by this anymore. But this is where Sitchin's trying to... to, He's trying to show you here that they came to to Earth from in some spaceship from their planet Nibiru, and that's not what this is telling. That's That's not what happened here. The reason they were in the sea and in the water was because the Great Flood had just happened, and their cities had been wiped out. So they had these suits on that were like fish suits that would allow them to, to uh, survive. And then that's when they came ashore and started setting up their new cities after uh, the flood, the fall of Atlantis. And uh, that's when we started to see the rise of Samaria. The first group numbered 50. Their leader, their leader all the texts agree, was Ea, whose abode is water. The prototype Aquarius, Oanes, had arrived on Earth. Several Sumerian texts deal with and describe the first arrival. One titled by scholars, The Myth of Enki and the Earth, Enki and the World Order, or Enki and the Lands Order, contains an actual autobiographical account by Ea or Enki, the long text restored from tablets and fragments scattered between two museums includes the following first-person per- statements by him. I am the leader of the Anunnaki, engendered by Fe- Fecund Seed, the firstborn son of divine An, the big brother of all the gods. When I approached from heaven, bountiful rains poured down from the sky. When I approached earth, <coughs> there was high tide. When I approached its green meadows, heaps and mounds were piled up at my command. Heaps and mounds were piled up at my command. Makes you wonder if he, you know, caused these mounds to be formed by his, you know, telekinetic powers or something. One of the first tasks was to establish a command post, a headquarters house. It was built at the edge of reed-growing marshes. Some of the oldest cylinder seals illustrating Shamir's earliest times depict reed huts of the kind that the Anunnaki could have erected from the readily available reeds at the edge of the marshes. They all depict inexplicable antenna-like devices protruding from the roofs of those reed huts. His outpost needed to be built on an artificial mound. Raised higher than the level of the river and marsh waters, Enki assigned the task to one of his lieutenants named Enki Medu. So is that where the, the, the mound making came from? And that's why they were all over the goddamn place. They had to get a signal. It's like a, uh, 
you ever been out to the fucking sticks before? Out where my grandparents live, way out in East Texas. I mean, we're talking about way out in the sticks. If you want to get your cell phone to work, you had to go out on top of whatever the nearest hill was. Uh, no, the floods didn't make the mounds. The mounds were, with, were built to withstand the floods. The mounds were built pre-flood. I have footage in my film, my new film, that shows these mounds when the Ohio River flooded around Illinois. And uh, the, it's, I've got actual helicopter video. Right, And everything around this whole area is completely underwater and completely flooded for miles and miles and miles. But there's those mounds, man, standing tall. They're, they're, they're made to, uh, to withstand it. So these guys, that's why they built all these mounds everywhere. Of course, it was, it was great that they doubled as, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, worship centers and, they, and, and pick up points and drop points probably for ships and who knows what else, these fuckers are trying to get a signal. I can't get a signal over here, Bob. Build me a mound up there so I can check the game score, shipper. Well, that's crazy. After he had cast his eye on that spot, Inky raised it above the Euphrates. Inky Madu, the one of the ditch and dike, Inky placed in charge of ditch and dike. Inki, the text continues, then gathered his lieutenants at his command post. They included the weapons carrying the chief pilots and the chief of supplies, the lady of grinding and milling, and the blank, blank, blank who purifies the water. Besides shelter, nourishment had to be found, and the marshes offered an ample fresh supply. The carp fish waved their tails among the reeds. The birds chirped to me from their blank... Inky wrote, subsequent sections of the text written in third person record Inky's orders to the lieutenants. The location of those activities is indicated by several references to the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, where they come close to each other, close enough for Inky to make the two meet and cause their pure waters to eat together. Several additional sections of the text deal with water-related activities following their arrival. Enki himself is credited with waterworks affecting the two rivers and other lieutenants and named for water-related tasks. He filled the Tigris with sparkling water in order to make the Tigris and Euphrates eat each other, or eat together, rather. Enki, Lord of the Deep Waters, placed in Bill Lulu, the inspector of canals, in charge thereof. But breaks in the tablets or use of undeciphered terminology leave the nature of some water-related operations uncertain. These include a seawater alignment to a female lieutenant whose epitaph, Nin Ciara, Lady of Bright Metal, suggests duties linked to precious metals. Ah, they put her in charge of the mining, huh? Other unexpected references to metals, specifically to gold, are also made in a section dealing with Inky's post-arrival waterborne inspection of his watery wonderland. He toured the surroundings in a rowboat whose commander held a rod for detecting and measuring gold in his hand, his epitaph name, Nim Gear Sig, meant chief determinator of luster. Depictions on early cylinder seals show Inky in a reed boat navigated among the reeds with a lieutenant god holding a rod-like device. The boat is equipped at both ends with poles to which are attached circular devices akin to those placed atop the reed huts. What do all these tidbits of information mean? It behooves us to ask at this point a key question regarding the Anunnaki's coming to Earth. Was it accidental? Were they traveling in a spacecraft and due to a mishap looked for some solid ground to land on in an emergency and found the speck of firm ground called Earth? Were they perhaps explorers roaming space for pleasure or research who saw, as Inky described, a watery, verdant place, and stopped by to take a look? In such circumstances, the visit to our planet would have been a one-time event. But the overwhelming ancient evidence indicates that the visit lasted an incredibly long time, that it entailed permanent settlements, that the Anunnaki kept coming and going, and that even when a calamity, the deluge destroyed all, they stayed on and started all over. 
This is a pattern of a planned colonization for a purpose. Enki and his crew of 50 had come to Earth, I have suggested, for the purpose of obtaining gold. The purpose emerges, and the tidbits of information begin to make sense. If treated as dots to be connected to what followed, the plan was to extract the gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf. By the way, I found out this area, area down there at uh, Lake Buchanan at Barrier Hill, Lalano. Yeah, come to find out, uh, they have found uh, quite a bit of gold and, and silver down there. So it's it's definitely made me wonder if this was one of their uh, the Anunnaki's m- you know main mining locations or something. Maybe that's why they haven't found very much in there because they basically you know got all the materials out that they needed and left it behind. It's very possible. But when this did not work, a change to deep mining had to be undertaken. In that second phase of the Anunnaki's activities on Earth, other gods arrived. Leading them was Enlil, the lord of the command, for whom a new city of the gods, Nippur, was established. Its heart was a command and communications hub where orbit-controlling tablets of destinies spun and hung in the Duran Key, the bond of heaven and earth, the holy of holies. That's the stargate. That's the bond of heaven and earth. While Enlil took charge of the Eden with its settlements, each with distinct functions, Enki's task shifted to a new location called the Abzu. It is a term commonly translated the deep, but which literally read means the place of shining metal. The Abzu is the place of shining metal. And the 12th planet, I have suggested that the meaning of this combination of two syllables, that in Sumerian could be read in reverse, Zuab, without changing its connotation, has been retained in Hebrew as Zab, gold. Abzu, Zuab, thus meant the place from whose depths the shining metal gold was obtained. The depth connotation indicated about the gold was obtained by mining. The Abzu, according to all relevant Sumerian texts, was located in a distant region called Arali, the place of the shining loads by the water. In the lower world is a geographic term that applied in varied texts, includes some dealing with the deluge to southern Africa. Arali, I wrote, was in northeastern Africa, a gold mining region to this day. The changes that accompanied the second phases of activities of the Anunnaki involved more than a shift of an attempt to easily extract gold from seawater to the need of obtaining it by arduous deep mining. It also involved a change in mission policies, a change of commanders, and the unintended transfer to Earth of personal rivalries and clan clashes from the Anunnaki's home planet Nibiru to planet Earth. Varied texts among the Atrahasis epic detail the tale of the ensuing events. They were, as we shall see, the forerunners to the creation of man, the explanation for the circumstances of the deluge, and the key to unlocking the enigmas of the demigods. The arrival, as described in Inky's autobiographical text, was not the beginning of the chain of momentous events, For the real beginning, we have to start with the tale of creation itself, just as the people of Mesopotamia had done each New Year time. We have to read, reread, and understand the Mesopotamian Enuma Elish and the biblical tale of Genesis. The precise information they provide not only explains many of the phenomena in our solar system and beyond, it sheds light on the origins of life, on who we are, and how we came to be here on planet Earth. So that's the end of chapter five. Okay, let's get into uh, Sitchin here now, a planet called Nibiru. The notion of space travel is no longer relegated to science fiction alone. Serious scientists do not rule out that one day, someday, we Earthlings might send astronauts not just to our celestial satellite, the moon, but also to another planet farther out. Some savants even dare acknowledge that life, even like ours, might exist somewhere in the vast universe with its countless galaxies and constellations and billions of stars, orbited by satellites called planets. But such sentient beings, even if clever enough to have their own space program, 
so the argument goes, could never visit us, or we them, because the nearest possible place in the heavens where such life could exist is light years away, a light year being the ungraspable distance that life travels in one year. But what if such a compatible planet were to exist much closer, say, in our own solar system? What if travel between it and Earth needs only so many normal years, not light years? That is not a theoretical question, because that is precisely what we are told by the ancient texts. If only we stop treating them as myth and fantasy and consider them to be factual recollections and records of actual events. It was by doing that that the trailblazing the 12th planet book became possible. Logically, for Eridu and Mesopotamia to be home away from home, there had to be a home from which Enki had come. For his crew of 50 to be called those who from heaven to earth came, the Anunnaki, they had to have come from a place, an actual place in the heavens. Thus, there had to be a place somewhere in the heavens where the journey to earth began, a place where intelligent beings capable of space travel some 450,000 years ago, could live. We call it Planet X or Planet of the Anunnaki in ancient Mesopotamia. It was called Nibiru. Its ubiquitous symbol throughout the ancient world was the winged disk. Its orbit was traced and observed most reverently, and it is beyond dispute that countless texts starting with the epic of creation referred to it by name repeatedly. When, at the end of the 19th century, astronomical tablets from Mesopotamia were found and deciphered, The savants at the time, Franz Kugler and Ernest Widener, stand out to this day, debated whether Nibiru was just another name for Mars or for Jupiter. It was an accepted axiom that the ancients could not be aware of any planet beyond Saturn. It was a major breakthrough moment when it dawned on me in the middle of the night that Nibiru is neither Mars nor Jupiter. That is the same of one more planet, is the name of one more planet in our own solar system. Well, there actually is, here's the thing about it, there's, there's Sumerian depictions that show um, our solar system and all the planets in the right orbit around it. Now, how did they do that in ancient Sumeria without telescopes or anything else? But here's the interesting key thing, and something that Sitchin and other people don't key in on. That depiction doesn't depict one extra planet. It depicts two. But somehow, Sitchin and every other person that's ever talked about Sumerian text always seems to leave that out, and it bothers the shit out of me, and I won't let it go. Because there is a lot of evidence for this uh, planet Vulcan, and I think that the Nibiru thing has been a red herring to hold, withhold that from us. I mean, my God, Japan sent a... a spacecraft to check this thing out a couple of years ago, they thought they that they were being sneaky and encoding the stuff into, into the name that we wouldn't catch it. You know, with uh, the Japanese Icarus spacecraft was what it was. Somebody said it was going to fly uh, to the uh, other side of Venus and then to the other side of the sun, which is where Vulcan is said to be, have located at. And, of course, Icarus being the son of Vulcan in Greek mythology. When at the end, uh, oh no, I already read that. Uh, One could start the chain of evidence where the Hebrew Bible has it in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, so began virtually all the translations of Hebrew Bible's first three words. Bear shit? That's what it says. Bear shit. Bear shit. B-E-R-E-S-H-I-T. That's some great Hebrew right there. Bear shit bara Elohim. Bear shit bara Elohim. I like that. There I have a son. I'm going to name him Bear shit bara Elohim Reeves. Hey, get over here, Bear shit. Yep. Yep, we call him Bear shit. Bear shit Elohim Reeves. Yep. For the moment, we shall treat such a translation as valid. Continuing with just 31 verses, the Hebrew Bible then encapsulates creation from how the sky above with the hammered bracelet, which is the asteroid belt, 
and the earth below were formed, to how life on earth came to be, from grasses to marine to vertebrae and mammalian, and finally man. The biblical sequence, including a dinosaur phase in verse 21, matches modern scientific findings about evolution so that the notion that Bible and science are in conflict is baseless. The discoveries of the inscribed tablets of the Mesopotamian epic of creation have no doubt that whoever had written the biblical rendering was well aware of the tale in the Illuma Elish, condensing its six tablets plus a laudatory seventh to six phases or days of creation plus a sanctified seventh day of divine gratification. Such awareness of the sequence rendered in Enuma Elisha was not only possible due to the proliferation of and durability of the tablets containing the text, it was probably unavoidable. Because the Epic of Creation was read in public as part of the annual New Year, New Year Festival, first in Sumer and then in Babylon, Assyria, and beyond, throughout the ancient Near East. The reading started at eve time on the festival's fourth day and lasted through the night for Enuma Elish, as the most complete Babylonian version of the epic is called. It is long and detailed. Its central religious scientific aspect was a battle between a celestial goddess called Tiamat and a heavenly avenger come savior god, the main reason why the text has been treated by modern scholars, both as a myth and as an allegorical tale of good and evil a kind of ancient St. George of the Dragon's Tale. What I've heard is is that these, uh, essentially, that, that, that I've heard that there's, I don't know where this information comes from, um, but I've heard that actually the reason why the Anunnaki came here was because they came here basically uh, because they were fugitives from wherever they came from. And that they were being tailed and followed across the solar system uh, because they were wanted for something that they did. They were marauders. They had basically they were basically wanted for something they did on their own planet. And that at that time there was another planet near Earth called Tiamat that was a water planet. And that on Earth at that time, it looked like Star Wars. You know, it looked like Tatooine, it looked like two suns. Because the sun would reflect its light on this water planet. And so you know how light reflects off water. It's like glass. It's like a mirror. So there, at that time on Earth, appeared to be two suns on Earth, one of which was Tiamat. And that supposedly these Anunnaki who were being followed put some kind of a decoy thing on Tiamat to make these uh, other extraterrestrials, whoever they were following them, think that they were on this other planet. So they did, allegedly, I I don't know if this story is true or not. I'm just telling you what I've read and what I've heard. Um, So don't take this as the gospel. And then then supposedly they, uh, they took the bait. They thought they were on Tiamat. They launched a strike on Tiamat that caused it to explode, causing the the entire amount of water on this planet to fall down onto Earth, which is what caused the Great Deluge, the Great Flood, and then the rest of the pieces broke off and uh, formed the asteroid belt. Now, again, I don't know if that's true, but um, it does kind of make sense to me, you know? Such awareness of the sequence rendered in Enuma Elisha was not only possible due to the proliferation. Oh, I already read that. Um, Its central religious scientific aspect was a battle between a celestial goddess called Tiamat and a heavenly avenger come savior, God. In the 12th planet, I audaciously suggest instead of the, that the epic of creation is at its core a great scientific text that starts with a cosmology that embraces the whole solar system, explains the origins of the earth, moon, and the asteroid belt, 
reveals the existence of planet Nibiru, proceeds through the arrival of the Anunnaki gods on Earth, and describes the creation of man and the rise of civilization. Adapted to promote religious political purposes, an appended ending hails the victorious assumption of supremacy by the relevant National Guard in Lil and Sumer, Marduk in Babylon, Asher in Assyria. Irrespective of version, when the primeval events began, heaven above and firm earth below had yet come into existence. Enuma Elish la Nabu Shamamu, when in the above heaven has not been named. Shalipatu Amamtum Shuma la Zacharot, and below firm earth had not been called. At that primeval time, the ancient text states the solar system began to take shape with just three celestial actors, a primordial Apsu, its companion Mumu, and a female celestial entity called Tiamat. The three names in the Babylonian text have been retained unchanged from the undiscovered Sumerian original and mean, respectively, one who exists from the beginning, one who was born, and maiden who gives life. Celestial gods, planets, then begin to be endangered as Tiamat, a watery planet, starts to mingle the waters with the male Apsu, the sun. First, the pair Lahamu and Lamu are formed in the space between them. Then, surpassing them in stature, the larger pair Kishar and Anshar appear. And finally, the pair Anu and Nuimid are formed farther out. These are Sumerian names attesting to the Sumerian origin of the epic, except that Anu is Babylonian for the Sumerian An, the Heavenly One. The resulting solar system accurately conforms to our solar system and its planetary layout as we know them, except for Tiamat, of which much more we will know soon. The sun, Apsu, the one who existed from the beginning, Mercury, Mamu, the one who was born, the sun's companion. Venus, Lahamu, lady of battles. Mars, Lamu, deity of war. Tiamat, maiden who gives life. Jupiter, Kishar, foremost of firm lands. Saturn, Anshar, foremost of the heavens. Gaga, Anshar's messenger, the future. Pluto, Uranus, Anu, he of the heavens, Neptune, Ea, Nudimid, artful creator. Modern science holds that our solar system was formed about 4.5 billion years ago when a whirling cloud of cosmic dust ringing the sun began to coalesce, forming planets orbiting it. Planets spaced out in the same orbital plane called ecliptic and circling in the same direction counterclockwise. The description in the ancient Mesopotamian epic is in accord with these modern findings, but offers a different and probably more accurate sequence of planet formation. The Sumerian names of the planets are meaningful and accurate descriptions of these celestial bodies, facts that modern astronomy keeps discovering, as, for example, a 2009 discovery that is indeed Saturn, Anshar, and not the more massive Jupiter, Kishar. That is, foremost of the heavens due to its system of rings that tremendously extend its reach. The resulting solar system, the epic relates, was unstable and chaotic at its start. The planetary orbits were not yet firmly set. The divine brothers banded together, getting in each other's way. They disturbed Tiamat as they surged back and forth, moving in unstable orbits, orbits, crowding toward Tiamat. Even the gravitational and magnetic forces of the sun were ineffective. Apsu could not lessen their clamor. Again, modern science, too, discarding a long-held notion that once the solar system was formed, it was not done. Uh, Once the solar system formed, it was done. Now finds that it was unstable for a long time after its formation and that shifting collisions were taking place. The unstable celestial gods, by their annex in heaven, were now troubling the belly of Tiamat. People have gotten confused about this and asked me about this before, and really all they were doing 
is they were making an allegory for the um, for what was going on in our solar system after it formed. That's what these all this warring planets and all this stuff was about in these ancient Sumerian texts. A lot of people have been confused by that because they're associating names of gods with these planets, but they, they don't really mean that uh, those planets are gods. All the planets are Satan. Remember that? That lady sent me that email that time. All the planets are Satan. And you're bad. The planets are Satan. All the planets are Satan. Wow. I think being off your beds is Satan. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> at least in your case. So, yeah, maybe that clears that up for people there. They were causing her to sprout her own fearsome assembly, a group of her own satellite moons. Thus, in turn, brings this in turn brings more to- turmoil that endangers the other celestial gods. At this dangerous phase, the outermost celestial god Ninumid, or Neptune, takes matters into his own hands. Surpassing in wisdom, accomplished, resourceful, this celestial deity balances the wobbly solar system by inviting an outsider, one more large celestial god. The newcomer was not formed with the others. It is a stranger coming from afar. It originated far out in the heart of the deep, and it is filled with awesomeness. <laughs> That's a funny thing to say. It's filled with awesomeness. Yes, it's filled with awesomeness. Alluring was his figure, flashing was the gaze of his eyes, lordly was his gait, commanding from the beginning. Artfully arranged beyond comprehension were his members, beyond understanding, difficult to look upon. Subjected to the gravitational pull of Nadimid, and coming under the influence of other planets, the stranger from outer space curves its course towards the solar system center. When it passes too closely near Anu, Uranus, the cumulative gravitational forces tear off chunks of matter, and the invader sprouts four wings or winds, satellites, and moons that were around it. One cannot be certain whether the original Sumerian text had already named the stranger from outer space Nibiru at this point, but it is certain that the Babylonian version changed it here to Marduk, the name of Babylon's national god. Marduk was also Ra. This trans... And he was also... uh, uh, He was Ra, Marduk, and uh, Baal as well. This transformation of Marduk from a god on earth to a celestial deity by renaming Nibiru Marduk was accompanied in the Babylonian text by the revelation that Nadimid, who engendered the newcomer by inviting him in, is none other than Ea Enki, the real father of the Babylonian's god Marduk, and that Anu is Ea Enki's father as proclaimed, in fact, by Enki in his earlier quoted autobiography. Thus, with a sleight of hand, the celestial tale became a religious political legitimization of a dynasty. Anu, Ea, Enki, Marduk. As the ancient text describes the progression of the invading planet, it becomes clear that it is moving in a clockwise direction, the opposite or retrograde of the other planets counterclockwise orbital direction. It is finding it is a finding that differs, that offers the only explanation to a varied, otherwise inexplicable, inexplicable, inexplicable phenomena in our solar system. This retrograde direction of Nibiru's path made an eventual collision with Tiamat inevitable, and the ensuing celestial battle, as the ancient text calls the collusion, the collision, not collusion, was a basic tenet of ancient knowledge reflected on countless references in the Bible's books of Psalms, Job, and the prophets. Disturbed by the new gravitational forces pacing about distraught, Tiamat gives rise to her own defensive host of 11 satellite moons. The Babylonian text describes them as roaring dragons clothed with terror. The largest of them, Kingu, is chief of her host. 
Kingu she exalted, in their midst she made him great. His task is to prepare for battle with the oncoming Marduk. As Kingu's reward, Tiamat readily readies him to join the assembly of the gods, to become a planet in his own right by granting him a celestial destiny, an orbital path. That alone was reason enough for the Sumerians and their successors to count this particular moon as a member in its own right of our solar system. As the stage is set for the celestial battle, Tablet 1 of the Enuma Elish comes to an end, and the scribe of the best-preserved version, one Nabu Mushetek Umi, describes at its end the customary colophon. First tablet of Enuma Elish, like the original tablet, a copy from Babylon. He also identifies the scribe whose tablet he copied, a tablet written and collated by Nabu Balastu Iqwibi, the son of Naid Marduk. The copying scribe then dated his work, the month of Er, the ninth day, the 27th year of Darius. Discovered at Kish, the first tablet of the Enuma Elish is thus identified by its scribe as a copy of made at the start of the 5th century B.C. during the reign of Darius I. By a twist of fate, it was the same Darius whose rock inscription in Behistun enabled Rawlinson to crack open the mystery of cuneiform writing. Tablet 2 of the Enuma Elish tracks the emergence of two opposing planetary camps headed for the inevitable collision. Treating the celestial gods as living entities, The text tells that while Tiamat was forming her ferociously whirling satellites, in the solar system's outer reaches, Ea Enki appealed to his grandfather Anshar to organize the varied planets and have them anoint Marduk as their leader in battling Tiamat and her host. Let him who is potent be our avenger. Let Marduk, keen in battle, be the hero. Give me a second here. A crucial stage is reached when Marduk nears the colossal Anshar. For Anshar, Saturn, his lips, majestic rings that extend out off the face of Anshar. Encountering them, the approaching Marduk kisses the lips of Anshar, the rings of Saturn. The passage by and acceptance by the dynastic great-grandfather encourages Marduk to voice his wishes. If I indeed, as your avenger, am to vanquish Tiamat, convene an assembly to proclaim my destiny supreme, a celestial destiny, an orbit greater than that of all the other planets, is what Marduk demanded. It is here, by now, Tablet 3, that according to Sumerian cosmology, the future Pluto obtains its planetary status and unique orbit. A moon of Anshar, Saturn, called Gaga, that is detached by the force of the oncoming Marduk and is thrust out as an emissary to Lamu and Lahamu purportedly to canvas their vote for the elevation of Marduk to leadership. When Gaga returns, it circles back all the way to the outermost Ea Neptune. There it becomes the planet we call Pluto, with its oddly inclined orbit that takes it at times beyond and sometimes inside the orbit of Neptune. Aware of that unusual orbit, the Sumerians depicted the planet as a two-faced deity seeing its master, Ea Enki Neptune, once this way and once the other way. With all the planets opposing Tiamat agreeing to Marduk's demands for supremacy, in Tablet 4, the giant Kishar Jupiter adds more weapons to Marduk's arsenal. In addition to the four satellites named South Wind, North Wind, East Wind, and West Wind that he had obtained from Anu Uranus, Three new awesome satellites, Evil Wind, Whirlwind, and Matchless Wind, are added, creating an awesome whirling battle entourage of seven in all. Thus reinforced, Marduk, filled with a blazing flame, 
able to shoot lightnings as arrows, possessing a magnetic field to ensnare Tiamat as in a net. Toward the raging Tiamat set his face. Tiamat, meanwhile, is orbiting in a direction toward the oncoming Nibiru, Marduk. The celestial battle, the collision, was about to occur. Tiamat and Marduk, the wisest of gods, advanced against each other. They pressed on in single combat. They approached for battle. The four winds he stationed, that nothing of her could escape. The south wind, the north wind, the east wind, the west wind. Close to his side he held the net, gift of his grandfather Anu, who brought forth the evil wind, the whirlwind and the hurricane, to trouble Tiamat's insides. All seven of them rose up behind him. In front of him, he set the lightning with a blazing flame. He filled his body with a fearsome halo. His head was turbaned. He wrapped with awesome terror as with a cloak. As the two hurtling planets neared each other, Marduk went on the attack. The Lord spread out his net to ensnare her. The evil wind, the rearmost, he let loose in her face. When Tiamat opened her mouth to devour it, he drove in the evil wind that she closed not her lips. Tiamat, according to this step-by-step account of the battle, was first struck with one of Marduk's seven satellites, where her mouth was, then Marduk's other moon served as weapons. So according to Sumerian cosmogony, as retained in the Enuma Elish, in this first encounter between Marduk and Tiamat, the two planets did not collide It was the winds of satellites of Marduk that struck Tiamat, fracturing her midst and extinguishing her life. While the final blow to the gas Tiamat is yet to be delivered in a subsequent encounter, in this first round, Marduk and his winds deal with Tiamat's host of orbiting satellites. The smaller ones, shattered, trembling with fear, turned their backs about to save their lives. Tightly encircled, they could not escape. The phrase turned their backs about. Thrust in the direction of the advancing Marduk, they became the otherwise inexplicable retrograde orbiting comets. Ah, that makes sense. Kingu, their leader, rendered lifeless, is bound and held captive. He is deprived of the tablet of destinies that was about to make it a planet in its own right. Snatching it, Marduk took away from him the Tablet of Destinies, not rightfully his, and transferred the orbital capability to himself. Devoid of an atmosphere, Kingu is turned into Dugage, a Sumerian term that can be best translated as lifeless circular. Doomed to forever keep circling Earth. There you go, there's our moon. I've, I've said that for years, and I thought that the moon was some kind of, you know, planet that was basically just destroyed and just stripped down to its uh you know if you if you stripped earth down to the bedrock and just stripped everything all else off of this planet it would basically look like our moon it'd just be a big chunk of floating rock in space now unable to go into orbit marduk subtle circles back to revisit anshar and ia Ninimid and reports his victory to them As he completes his first solar orbit, he is coming back to the site of the celestial battle. Marduk turned his back to Tiamat, whom he had subdued. This time, Marduk himself collides with the wounded Tiamat, cleaving her apart. The fate of the two parts is of crucial importance. Every word in the ancient text is significant, for it is here that we are witnessing the Anunnaki's sophisticated understanding of how the Earth, the Moon, and the asteroid belt came to be. In the 12th planet, I have suggested that the severed upper half skull of Tiamat, thrust off to another place in the solar system, became the planet Earth in a new orbital path, that Kingu, doomed to become a lifeless circular, was carried with it to become Earth's moon, and that the hinder part of Tiamat smashed to bits and pieces and became the asteroid belt or the hammered bracelet. That the shattered smaller moons of Tiamat became the puzzling retrograde comets 
that turned back and assumed Marduk's retrograde orbit is reinforced by their statement that Marduk tied them to his tail, pulling them in his own retrograde orbital direction. That's interesting. This understanding of the creation tale reaffirmed repeatedly in various Sumerian texts also offers the only plausible explanation for the biblical verses in Genesis dealing with the event and the origin of life on earth. All right, here we go. In the first encounter, satellite moons of Marduk strike and disable Tiamat. And the second decisive encounter, Marduk itself treads upon, strikes, and come in, comes in contact with Tiamat, splitting her in two. It is thus that the seed of life present on Marduk is transferred to and shared with the future Earth. Keeping Tiamat's waters, it is a future watery planet. The upper half skull of Tiamat is thrust off to a new orbital location, and to become the Earth now seeded with DNA from Marduk. The thrust half, the future Earth, carries with it the lifeless Kingu to become its moon. Is it, and this really just sounds like, a, like an allegory for a terraforming event to me. I don't know why. The bottom part is smashed to bits and pieces, tied together as a bracelet. It becomes the asteroid belt. Where the celestial battle had taken place, where Tiamat had once orbited, is turned, termed Shamamu in Akkadian, and Shamayim in Hebrew, terms that are translated as heaven, but which stem from Mayim, waters, the place where the watery Tiamat used to be. In the Mesopotamian text, the affirmation of this sequence was repeatedly expressed by the following statement. After heaven had been separated from earth, after earth had been moved away from heaven. Having reshaped the heavens, created earth, and fashioned the hammered bracelet, Marduk crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. His great abode he measured. Liking what he saw, the Mesopotamian text state, he, Marduk, founded the, the station of Nibiru. What is the station of Nibiru? Like a space station? Celestially, by making our solar system his abode, Marduk has become planet Nibiru. A tenth planet, a twelfth member of the solar system. But as I said before, what if it's not? What if it's what if it's him and some giant ship that's just in an, in an orbit we can't see? What if the old the people in the olden times thought it was a planet, but it was a ship because it was so big when it was seen from Earth, it looked like a planet. A tenth planet, a twelfth member of the solar system, sun, moon, and ten planets has been added exactly as depicted on a cylinder seal from twenty five hundred B.C. It is in the Voyadashi Tashis Museum in Berlin. The similarity of the order of planetary formation per Enuma Elish speaks for itself. The new planet's orbit stretched from the Apsu region to the abode of Ia, from an abode, Perigi, near the sun, to an abode, Apagi, well beyond Neptune. With this great elliptical orbit, Marduk's celestial destiny became supreme just as he had been promised. This orbit, the epic states, is what gives the new member of our solar system its, its name for Nibiru, crossing. Planet Nibiru, the crossroads of heaven and earth he shall occupy, above and below the gods shall not go across. They must await him. Called Shar, which means the king's, this orbit equated mathematically 3,600, suggesting that this was the orbital period of Marduk, or Nibiru, 3,600 Earth years, as it returns annually, one orbit being one year for Nibiru, to its perigee where Tiamat had been. Nibiru intersects the ecliptic. It is its crossing point, and whenever mankind has witnessed that occurrence, Nibiru was depicted as a radiating planet 
symbolized by the sign of the cross. Geologically, geophysical, and biological evidence gathered on Earth, on the moon, and from asteroids and meteorites have convinced modern scientists that a cataclysm, a catastrophic collision event, affecting our part of the solar system had occurred circa 3.9 billion years ago, about 600,000 years after the formation of the solar system. The event I have suggested was the celestial battle between Marduk and Tiamat. The Enuma Elish filled up four tablets with the tale of creation thus far. The Hebrew Bible did it in eight verses in two divine days. In the familiar King James translation, we learn that when the creation of heaven and earth began, the earth was without form and void, and the deep was in darkness. Then the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God commanded, let there be light, and there was light. And having divided the light from the darkness, God called the light day and the darkness night. And it was evening and it was morning, day one. One would be less hard put to discern in those words their Mesopotamian origin if the actual Hebrew text is followed. There the darkness was not upon the face of the deep, but upon Tehum, Hebrew for Tiamat. It is Ruah, the wind, not spirit, Marduk's satellite that moved against Tiham Tiamat as his lightning, not mere light, struck her. Verses 6-8 The events of day two translations use the term firmament to describe the asteroid belt. Yeah, the waters above the firmament. That's that's what that was referring to. Where the Hebrew says Raki Ah, which is Rakish in the Babylonian text, which literally means hammered bracelet. Located in the midst of the waters to separate the waters above from the waters below, it is the Sham Mayim, the place of the waters that is translated heaven. Choosing to skip the polytheistic sections about the multiple gods' genealogy, rivalries, and discussions, the editor-author of Genesis just restated the scientific fact of an earth cleaved off of Tiamat as a result of a celestial collision. The ancient view was that the hammered bracelet asteroid belt served as a firmament or a heaven separating celestial regions. The Hebrew term for that region, the Shara Rim, and its meaning, heaven, were obviously borrowed directly from the opening verse of the Enuma Elish. Elish la Nabu Shamamu. In the above heaven had not been named. Indeed, the whole biblical notion of a celestial above and a celestial below stemmed from the two opening verses of the Enuma Elish. The above from the first verse just quoted, and the below from the second verse, Shatlitu Amamantum Shuma La Zakrat. Below, firm earth had not been called. Such a celestial division to an above the firmament and heaven to a below seem baffling at first glance. But they become pertinent and clear when we illustrate the statement about Nibiru's attaining the crossing in the midst of where Tiamat had been. Passing at its perigee between Mars and Jupiter, Nibiru indeed makes the crossing in the midpoint between all the other planets of the solar system, the moon included. As the Bible's terminology explains, the Shama Yaim Literally, the place of the waters, but translated heaven, the place of the firmament, the place where Nibiru crosses, indeed divides the planetary system into an above and a below. Into the solar system's outer planets in the above and the inner planets in the below, near the sun. What the Enuma Elish in the Bible say is confirmed by modern astronomy that refers to the below group as the terrestrial planets and the above group as the outer planet separated by the asteroid belt. The basic tenet of ancient cosmology and astronomy is even confirmed by a depiction on a Sumerian cylinder seal now on view in the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem, Israel, that graphically expresses this celestial division. It uses the straw used in beer drinking 
as the dividing asteroid belt to its left side, the below planet, starting with Venus as the eighth planet, the Earth and its crescent moon, and Mars nearest the belt. And on the other side, it shows the above Jupiter and Saturn with its rings. As Tablet 5 begins, the continuing Enuma Elish text then ascribes Marduk the establishment of the precincts of night and day by assigning night to the moon, daytime to the sun, and credits him with all the Sumerian astronomical achievements. It was he who instituted a loony solar calendar, fixed the zenith, divided the heavens into three zones, and grouped the stars in 12 zodiacal constellations, giving them their images. We find that this segment repeated almost verbatim in Genesis 1.14 to 19, where God is credited with dividing the day from the night, making the sun and the moon responsible for seasons, days, and years, and forming the constellations and also their signs. With all celestial matters taken care of, divine attention shifted to Earth itself, to making it habitable. In the Mesopotamian text, we reach Tablet 5, a complete and almost intact tablet, was found only in the late 1950s at an unlikely Turkish site called Sultan Tepe. From it, one learns that after Marduk had given the sun and the moon their appointed tasks, he turned his attention and creative energy to making Earth, the former upper part of Tiamat, a viable place. Clearly, having just been cleaved off from Tiamat, Earth is in need of reworking and reshaping by its creator to become a habitable planet with mountains, rivers, flowing waters, etc. Returning to the Bible, we find that Genesis 2 reports that having completed the celestial arrangements, divine attention turned to Earth. Verses 9 through 10 describe the steps taken to make it habitable. Again, here's some terraforming stuff going on here. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land Earth, and called the gathered together. I'm sorry, he called the gathered together waters, seeds. This biblical account is in full accord with the modern findings that all of Earth's dry land began as one supercontinent, Pangaea, that emerged when all the Earth's waters were gathered into one vast pan-ocean. Pangaea in time broke up, and its parts drifted off away from each other, becoming several continents. This modern continental drift theory is fundamental to all Earth sciences, but to find it clearly stated in the Bible and probably in the missing lines of Tablet 5, is quite remarkable. The Hebrew and the Babylonian texts provide here a logical and scientifically accurate process. The wounded segment of the watery Tiamat begins to assume a planetary shape. The waters collect in the cavitous parts, of which the Pacific Ocean is the largest and deepest, revealing dry land. The continents appear, mountains are pushed up, Volcanoes spout lava and gases, giving rise to an atmosphere. Clouds and rains come, rivers begin to flow. Earth is ready for life. Thus states the Enuma Elish in Tablet 5, line 65, He, Marduk, created heaven and earth. Thus states the Bible in Genesis 2, verse 1, were completed the heavens and the earth, and all their lost. By treating Enuma Elish as a sophisticated cosmology and not as an allegorical tale of struggle between good and evil, we have obtained a coherent explanation for many puzzles in our solar system and explain the incredible, fa incredibly fast appearance of life on Earth and the compatibility between the Anunnaki and the daughters of man. The Bible, I suggest, has done the same. Chapter 7 of Anunnaki and Agigi. Let me get a drink here. All right, of Anunnaki and Agigi, Chapter 7. It was probably near midnight when the public reading of Enuma Elish in Babylon, accompanied by reenactments, a kind of passion play, had reached the statement that the creation of heavens and the earth by Marduk had been accomplished. 
Now it was time to translate his celestial supremacy to supremacy among the Anunnaki, the heavenly gods who came to earth. With admirable subtlety, the name Enlil, the deity who probably was the hero hero of the creation tale in its Sumerian original, is mentioned for the first time alongside those of Anu and Ea Enki. It is slipped into the very last line of Tablet 4. Then, as the tale continues on Tablet 5, other deities, including Marduk's real mother, Domkina, take the stage, and the listener finds himself witnessing Marduk's coronation as king, not only by the Anunnaki gods, but also by another group of deities called Igigi, those who observe and see. Ah, See, that's another one that that's a, that that's an answer to another question. Is that uh, I've been asked, you know, were these Agigi just workers or were they also gods? And it does appear they were also gods, but it also appears that they were of some either so you know, either either of lower intelligence or of lower stock. I'm not really for sure. So yeah, indeed, they were more than just the. Uh, Primitive workers. <coughs> uh, not only by the Anunnaki gods, but also by another group of deities called the Agigi, those who observe and see. Those would be, I take it, the watchers. So it's nice to see that, again, that distinction between, um, you know, your regular straight up Anunnaki and the Agigi. Uh, well, I think oftentimes people think the Watchers and the Nephilim and all that stuff, the Watchers are the uh, same as the Anunnaki, but they're really not the same. It is a grand assembly of all the leading gods. Marduk is seated on a throne, and his proud parents, Ya, Enki, and Damkina, open their mouths to address the great gods, saying, formerly Marduk was merely our beloved son. Now he is your king. Proclaim his title, king of the gods of heaven and earth. Compliance to that request, demand followed. Being assembled, all the Agigi bowed down. Every one of the Anunnaki kissed Marduk's feet. They were assembled to do obedience. They stood before him, bowed, and said, he is the king. They gave sovereignty to Marduk. They declared for him a formula of good fortune and success, saying, whatever you command, we will do. The text does not state where the assembly is gathered. The narrative suggests that the coronation of Marduk is taking place on Nibiru, and it is followed by an assembly of the gods assigned to earth, reminding the gathered gods of his royal lineage, some ancestors who preceded Ea and Anu are invoked, Marduk, as newly elected chief, loses no time in outlining his divine program. Hitherto, he tells the gathered gods, You have resided in Ishara, the great abode of Anu on Nibiru. Now you will reside in a counterpart abode thereof that I will build in the below. In the below on earth, Marduk says, He has created firm ground suitable for a new home. I have hardened the ground for a building site. To build a home, my luxurious abode, I will establish therein my temple. Its shrines will affirm my sovereignty. I will call its name Babili, Gateway of the Gods. As the gathered gods rejoiced at hearing Marduk's project to establish Babylon, he went on to assign them their duties. Marduk, the king of the gods, to above and below divided the Anunnaki. To follow his instructions, 300 he assigned to the skies. As those who watch, he stationed them. In like manner, the stations on earth he defined. 600 of them on earth he settled. He issued all the instructions. To the Anunnaki of heaven and of earth, he allotted their tasks. The gods assigned to mission earth 
are thus divided right off into two groups. 300 named Agigi, those who observe and see, have sky duties and will be stationed above the earth. And on Mars, as we explain later. 600, the Anunnaki of heaven and earth, will be stationed on earth itself, and their first task per their Lord's instructions is to establish Babylon and raise therein Marduk's stage tower, Isagil, the house whose head is lofty. By the end of Tablet 6, Babili, the gateway of the gods with its tower that reaches heaven, are ready. The celestial Marduk is now also Marduk on earth, and the reciting of Enuma Elish proceeds to Tablet 7, which is a laudatory list of 50 names and 50 epitaphs of empowerment. With the title 50, the great gods proclaimed him Marduk the Supreme. Obviously, the epic's Babylonian text has rushed events here fast forward. Life has yet to emerge and evolve on Earth. Enki and his first crew of 50 Anunnaki are yet to splash down. Cities of the gods need to be established. Man has yet to appear, and the deluge still has to sweep over. For only in its aftermath does the episode of the Tower of Babylon take place. Whether the emissions are deliberate or not, the fact remains that all the interim developments still need to take place, not only according to the Bible, but also according to varied cuneiform texts. Indeed, even before one contemplates the events on Earth, one ought to parse the enigma of events on Nibiru, where the coronation of Marduk presumably took place. Who are the assembled gods? Who are the forefathers that Marduk invoked? The divine royal abode he plans to establish on earth is to serve as a counterpart to the divine royal abode of the god Anu, the Ishara on Nibiru. A king of what kingdom was Anu? Who were the Anunnaki and the Agigi assigned to duties for mission earth? How did they come to be present to reside on planet Nibiru? Why did 50 of them accompanying Ea or Enki, he's the same person, that's why they make the distinction that way, go to Earth in search of gold? And why at its peak were 600 Anunnaki and 300 Agigi needed? While Enuma Elish provides no such answers, we are not entirely at a loss to know them. Varied ancient texts fill in data and details, name names and describe events. We have already mentioned some of those texts. We will bring to light many others, some even in languages other than Sumerian or Akkadian. Together they provide the dots that can be connected to form a coherent and continuous tale. Paramount in that context is what they tell us about ourselves, how man and mankind came to be on this planet Earth. We can start unraveling the ball of yarn with a new the ruler on Nibiru during Marduk's confirmation as supreme leader of the Anunnaki and the Agigi. He was also a ruler on Nibiru during the first arrival on Earth, and Enki invoked his status as firstborn son of Anu in his autobiography. One can assume that it was Anu's form of kingship that was brought down from heaven by the Anunnaki and it was from his court that the traditional insignia of kingship emanated. A divine headdress, a scepter or staff, and a coiled measuring cord, these symbols appear in divine investiture depictions at all times, in which the god or the goddess grants these objects to the new king. An, or Anu, as a word, meant heaven. As a name, it meant the heavenly one. And its pictogram was a star. References in varied texts provide some information about Anu's palace, his court, and its strict procedures. We thus learn that in addition to his official consort, his spouse and two, Anu had six concubines. Well, now we know where Enki gets it from. 
So this guy's married and has six whores on the side that his wife's okay with. Talk about doing some fucking pouring, son. No wonder Inky's going around, pull the semen into the room. <laughs> Miller High Life pitcher's full of that stuff. Well, no wonder. Daddy's running around with a wife and six whores on the side. This guy, I mean, really? Six? Plus a wife. I understand, you know, the wife and maybe one. But you're, I mean, how do you have time to eat and go poop if your dick is wet that many times a day? I just, I don't understand it. But now I understand why we like to fuck so much as humans. That's what I learned from the Sumerian text more than anything else. <laughs> I do had six concubines. His offspring were 80 in number, only 14 of whom bore the divine titles in for males or nin for females. Now, wait a minute. He had 80 kids, but only 14 of them were eligible to have the godly names. Why is that? That right there implies, you know, some of them were bloodline and some of them weren't. His court aides included uh, included a chief chamberlain, three commanders in charge of the rocket ships, two commanders of the weapons, a minister of the purse, two chief justices, two masters of written knowledge, two chief scribes, and five assistant scribes. The rank and file of a new staff were termed Anuna, meaning Anu's heavenly ones. Anu's palace was located in the pure place. Its entrance was constantly guarded by two royal princes titled commanders of the weapons. They controlled two divine weapons, the Shar Ur, the royal hunter, and the Shar Gaz, the royal smiter. An Assyrian drawing purporting to show the, the gateway to a news palace showed two towers flanked by eagle men, uniformed Anunnaki astronauts, with the winged disc emblem of Nibiru centrally displayed. Other celestial symbols, a 12-member solar system, a crescent for the moon and seven dots for Earth, complete the presentation. When an assembly of the gods was called, it took place in the throne room of the palace. Anu sat on his throne, flanked by his son Enlil, seated on the right, and his son Ea seated on the left. Texts that recorded assembly proceedings indicate that virtually anyone present could speak up. Some of the deliberations were heated debates. But in the end, Anu's word was final. His decision was binding. Among his epithets was Divine 60, granting Anu under the sexagesimal base 60 numbering system the highest rank. The Sumerians and their successors have kept not only meticulous king lists, they also maintained elaborate god lists, lists of gods arranged by important and rank and grouped by families. In the more detailed lists, the prime name of the god or goddess was followed by their epithets. In some lists that attained a canonical status, the gods were arranged genealogically giving, so to say, their royal pedigree. There you go, bloodlines. That's why the bloodlines are important to the people and the powers that be, even to this day. There were local god lists and national god lists, short ones and long ones, the most comprehensive known to scholars by its opening line as the series On God and New and deemed the great god list occupies seven tablets and contains more than 2,100 names of gods and goddesses, a mind-boggling number for sure. But considerably misleading if one realizes that sometimes a score or more listings were really epithets for the same deity, the younger son of Enlil, for example, who was called Ishkur in Sumerian and Adad in Akkadian, and Teshub by the Hittites. 
He had another 38 different names. My goodness, that's where a lot of the confusion of this stuff comes from. The great God list also included the deities, spouses, and offspring, chief viziers, and other personal attendants. Each tablet of this series is divided into two vertical columns. The one on the left giving the deity's Sumerian name, epithet, and the matching one on the right, the equivalent name or meaning of the epithet in Akkadian. Among other shorter or partial god lists thus far discovered are also was also one known as the series on Anusha Amili. Despite its Akkadian title, it is an earlier basic listing of the Sumerian pantheon. It is from such lists that we learn that the names chosen in Enuma Elish for various planets were not accidental. They were names borrowed from the canonical god lists in order to enhance the genealogical claims of Marduk to supremacy. His being the son of Ea Inki, in turn the firstborn son of Anu, who in turn was the scion of a royal Nibirian line of 21 predecessors. The list includes, besides Anshar and Kishar, Lama and Lahama, also unfamiliar names such as Anshargal and Kishargal, in Uru Ula and Nin Uru Ula, and significantly a couple of oddly named Alala and Balili. The list of Anu's predecessors ends with the postscript 21 in Ama A, 21 lordly mothers and fathers. The great god list then names the children and functionaries of Anu's group, skipping his two principal sons and daughter. Enlil and Ninma, who are listed separately with their own family groups and aids. Whichever way these god lists are studied, the major and dominant position of the divine king Anu is unmistakable. Yet a text titled Kingship in Heaven found intact in a Hittite version reveals that Anu was a usurper, having seized the throne on Nibiru by forcefully deposing the reigning king. After calling upon the twelve mighty olden gods, the godfathers and the godmothers, and all the gods who are in heaven and those upon the dark-hued earth, to pay heed to the account of the usurpation, the text went on to say, Formerly in the olden days, Alalu was king in heaven. Alalu was seated on the throne. Mighty Anu, first among the gods, stood before him, bowed at his feet, and set the drinking cup in his hand. For nine counted periods, Alalu was king in heaven. In the ninth period, Anu gave battle to Alalu. Alalu was defeated. He fled before Anu and descended to the dark-hued earth. Down to the dark-hued earth he went. Upon the throne, Anu was seated. Serving then as the royal cupbearer, a task calling for utmost loyalty, Anu betrays the king's trust and seizes the throne in a bloody coup d'etat. Why? Though he bears the epithet title, first among the gods, the text fails to reveal the relationship between Anu and the reigning king. But the narrator's appeal to the olden gods, the fathers and the mothers of the gods, indicates a conflict or a struggle over the throne whose roots go back several generations. A conflict caused by past events, genealogical relationships, or dynastic rivalries. With secession rules that tried to untangle conflicting claims between a firstborn and a legal heir, between a son by a spouse and another by a concubine, and a rule granting primacy to a son by a half-sister, Anu evidently had claim on the throne that in his view trumped that of Alalu. Such conflicting claims, one must conclude, began long after I'm sorry, long before the Anu-Alalu incident, and as we shall see, continued after that. Certain aspects of the god list serve as clues to an old and festering problem regarding kingship on Nibiru, issues that is time affected, that in time affected events on Earth. In the great god list, the extant version was probably compiled in Babylon. The Enki group follows that of Anu's. The Enlilites came next followed by Ninershig's group. But in other lists, including the shorter Sumerian one, 
It is the Enlil group that follows Anu's. These varied positionings reflect a tug of war that calls for a closer look. The Great God list contains another puzzling feature. When it comes to Enki, it inserts into his listings the names of predecessor ancestor couples that are different from those of Anu's. They bear such name as Enuel, Ninuel, Enmuel, Ninmuel, Enlu, Ninlu, Indu, and Nindu. These are divine predecessor couples of Enki that are not found in the Anu group. It is only when the list comes to the tenth couple named Inshar and Kishar that an apparent match with Anshar and Kishar in Anu's list occurs. Since Anu was Enki's father, the separate or non-Anu ancestor couples had to represent the line of Enki's mother, who had to be someone other than Antu. In other words, a concubine. That, it became clear as events unfolded, was a serious hierarchical defect. In his autobiography, Inky declared with some desperation, I am the leader of the Anunnaki. Engineered by Fecund Seed, the firstborn son of divine On, the big brother of all the gods. <clears throat> Firstborn, indeed, he was. In- engendered by fecund seed, he was, but only from his father's side. When it came to be seated beside the enthroned Anu, it was Enlil who sat on the right, and the numerical ranking of the elite 12 great gods, Enlil was second to Anu with a rank of 50. Enki followed with a lesser rank of 40. Though Enki was first born, he was not the crown prince. That title was the right of succession, was granted by the younger Enlil because his mother was Antu. And Antu was not just Anu's official spouse. She was also a half-sister of Anu, providing Enlil with a double dose of the fecund genetic seeds. Ah, I got it. So that was his half-sister. He was uh, stabbing that. Okay. Just so we're clear here. See, these guys, these guys will fuck anything, man. These guys are out of control. It's one thing I've learned about Anunnaki's. They cannot keep it in their pants for anything. A picture thus emerges of two old-time clans vying for kingship on Nibiru. At times, at war, at times, seeking peace through intermarriage. a device not unknown to Earth where warring tribes or nations often resorted to royal intermarriage to bring peace, and taking turns on the throne, sometimes violently, as in the case of Anu's coup against Alalu. The name of the deposed king is clearly different from the many N ones, but is virtually identical to the only named Alala in Anu's list, suggesting affiliation to a different clan and access to the throne through intermarriage. The emphasis on one's genetic seed line and succession rules was reflected in the Bible's tale of the patriarchs. All right, let's continue tonight, picking up where we left off last time. A picture thus emerges of two old-time clans vying for kingship on Nibiru at times at war, at times seeking peace through intermarriage, a device not unknown on earth where warring tribes or nations often resorted to royal intermarriage to bring peace, and taking turns on the throne, sometimes violently as in the case of a news coup against Alalu. The name of the deposed king Alalu in Hittite is clearly different from the many EN names like Enki, but it's virtually identical to the oddly named Alala in Anu's list, suggesting affiliation to a different clan and access to the throne through intermarriage. Emphasis on one's genetic seed line and secession rules was reflected in the Bible's tale of the patriarchs. And I just wanted to back up a little bit, so we're starting now uh, fresh here. Was the violent overthrow of Alalu causing him to flee his home planet 
an isolated event or an episode in a history of continuous fighting between two clans, perhaps in planet-wide terms between two nations on Nibiru. The data in the God list suggests that his overthrow was a continuation of unresolved strife between the Nibirian clans. It was neither the first nor the last violent regime change. Some texts suggest that Alalu himself was an usurper and that later on attempts were made to overthrow Anu. A detail in the makeup of Anu's royal court offers a clue to the events on Nibiru. It is the listing of the three commanders in charge of the Mu rocket ships and two commanders of the weapons. Come to think of it, it means that five military men made up almost half the ministerial cabinet of 11. We exclude seven scribes. This is tantamount to a military government. There is an obvious stress on weaponry. Two of the five generals deal just with weaponry. When it comes to the palace proper, it was protected by two awesome weapon systems overseen by two royal princes. Protected from what? Protected from who? At the risk of preempting a chapter yet to follow, we can mention already here that in 2024 BC, the Anunnaki then on Earth resorted to the use of nuclear weapons and their continuing clan clashes. Several ancient texts, which we shall quote, state that seven nuclear devices were used, and it is clear that they were brought over to Earth from Nibiru. Whether or not the Shiraru or the Shargaz that protected Anu's palace were such weapons, it is evident that nuclear weapons were part of the Nibirian military arsenal. Were they ever used on Nibiru? Why not? If they were used on a distant planet called Earth, on which at their peak just 900 Nibirians were stationed, so much more was at stake on Nibiru itself. And it does talk about that. We talked about it in the Lost Book of Enki. They annihilated their planet, allegedly. And then fl the elites fled underground. And uh, now they had to come get gold so that the rest of their elites won't die on their planet after everybody else got wiped out because they wiped out their atmosphere using these quote-unquote terror weapons. Funny, we call them not nearly the same thing today. From viewing our solar system as a once-created, forever-frozen assemblage of planets orbiting a central nuclear cauldron, the sun, space-age astronomers now realize that the planets and even their moons are alive with natural phenomena have their own inner nuclear cores, create and emanate heat, sustain volcanic activity, have atmospheres, have changing climates. Some display frozen surfaces, some display Earth-like features. Many have water, some only chemical-filled lakes. Some seem bone-dead. Some reveal complex compounds that could be as associated with life. Seasons have been detected on exoplanets orbiting other distant star suns, planets whose mere notion of their prob probable existence was the dominion of science fiction until a few years ago. Our neighbor Mars, considered just decades ago a lifeless planet since its birth, is now known, thanks to unmanned space exploration in the 70s, to have had a proper atmosphere, flowing water, rivers, and vast seas and lakes with a frozen lake, water ice, and even muddy soil to this very day. It is noteworthy that in the 12th planet, we had already provided evidence that a habitable Mars served the Anunnaki as a way station for the interplanetary spacecraft from, from and to Nibiru. It was there that the Agigi were stationed to their task to operate smaller shuttle, shuttlecraft between Earth and Mars. On Earth, the Agigi landed their shuttlecraft on a vast platform with a launch tower called the Landing Place built of colossal stone blocks. We have identified it in the Stairway of Heaven as the site known as Baalbek in the Lebanon Mountains. The vast stone platform still exists, so do the remains of the launch tower, built of immense stone blocks that range from 600 to 900 tons each. And yes, Baalbek looks very similar to the... Uh, building style of the rock wall and other locations around the earth. Uh, Mohenjo-Daro and 
Sexy woman. At the northwest quarter of the platform, the tower was reinforced with three gigantic stone blocks weighing more than 1,100 tons each, known as the Trilithon. Local lore attributes them to the giants. Yep. Amorites. Which we know are Anunnaki and Nordics and everything else. All the same thing, folks. No separation. That separation is part of the mind control. Our own planet Earth has undergone a violent beginning, the gathering of oceans and seas, the rise and shifting of continents, volcanic eruptions and tidal waves, ice ages and warm intervals, a.k.a. climate change, he says. Yeah, exactly. Ice ages and warm intervals. It's, it's just something that, that Earth constantly undergoes. But now they want to try and sell us on this climate change you have to pay for. Well, fuck that. And atmospheric problems due to too much of this or too little of that, it is only logical to assume that planet Nibiru underwent similar natural events. Some who have read the 12th planet and accepted its conclusions regarding Nibiru still wondered how the Anuna could survive on a planet whose orbit takes it far away from the sun. Wouldn't they and all life freeze to death right off? My answer has been that we and life on Earth face the same issue, even though Earth is at a presumed livable distance from the sun. All we have to do is leave Earth's surface for a little bit, and we'll freeze to death. Earth, like other planets, has a nuclear core that produces heat. It gets warmer and warmer as miners tunnel deeper down. But our very thick, rocky mantle makes us dependent on heat coming from the sun. What protects us is Earth's atmosphere, acting as a greenhouse that keeps in the warmth we get from the sun. In the case of Nibiru, it is again the atmosphere that offers protection. But there, the need is mostly to keep in heat coming from the planet's core and prevent it from dissipating out into space. For it is only for part of its year, one orbit around the sun, that Nibiru's elliptical orbit provides a warm summer. During its much longer winter, the planet depends on its inner core heat to keep its life going. As all planets, Nibiru too must have undergone natural climate and atmospheric changes when its inhabitants became uh, capable of manned spaceflight and attained nuclear technology. The use of nuclear weapons made atmospheric problems worse. It was then, I suggested, in the 12th planet, that Nibiru scientists came up with the idea of creating a shield of gold particles to mend and protect their planet's damaged atmosphere, but gold was a rare metal on Nibiru, and its use or misuse for the planet's salvation only added to the simmering conflicts. It was against such a background of circumstances and events that Anu seized the throne from Alalu, and Alalu, escaping for his life in a rocket ship, sought haven on a distant and uninhabited strange planet. The Nibiruans called this distant planet Key. The ancient Hittite text made clear that down to the dark-hued earth, Alalu went. And, of course, the Hittites were uh, derivatives of the Amorites as well. So they have a Hittite text that says down to the dark-hued earth, Alalu went. (laughs) That's pretty definitive. (laughs) Wow. I'm going to have to remember that. Yeah, because I've identified these Hittites as being the same as the Amorites, so. They have texts about Alalu coming down to Earth. That's pretty important, I'd say. God damn, the size of this thing, man. Tell you what. His chance discovery that its waters contain gold served as a trump card for demanding reinstatement to kingship. In the Lost Book of Inki, I've suggested that Alalu agreed to let Ia come to verify the discovery because Ia was his son-in-law, having espoused for state reasons Alalu's daughter, Damkina. In the post-overthrow circumstances of mistrust and animosity, Inki, a son of Anu, son-in-law of Alalu, was perhaps the only one trusted by both sides to lead Mission Earth. 
And so it was that Ea and his crew of 50 came to Earth to retrieve and send back to Nibiru the invaluable metal, a mission and an arrival described by Ea in his autobiography. From then on, the main stage for the subsequent astounding events was planet Earth. As great as a scientist as Ea Inki was, he could not extract from the waters of what we now call the Persian Gulf more gold than it contained. Minute quantities requiring the processing of huge volumes of water. A great scientist that he was, Ea traced the gold to its nearest prime source, the gold loads deep in the rocks of the Abzu. If Nibiru must have the gold as it surely did, the Anunnaki had to switch to a mining operation and establish Arali, the land of mines. The changed nature of Mission Earth required more personnel, new equipment settlements on two continents, new transportation and communication facilities. It all required a different type of leader, one less of a scientist and one more with organizational discipline and command experience. The one chosen for the task was Enlil, the Lord of the Command, the Crown Prince. Subsequent events showed him to be a strict disciplinarian by the, and a by-the-book commander. Yeah, good cop, bad cop. While Inky's coming to Earth is documented in his inscribed autobiography, in Lil's journey is recorded in another kind of document. It is an unusual circular tablet, a disc made of an unusual kind of clay, found in the ruins of Nineveh. Its present keeper, the British Museum in London, displays it just as a sample of ancient writing. An incredible act of missing the point. For the artifact provides a unique depiction of the heavens in which the route of Enlil from his planet to Earth is described both graphically and in words. Unbelievable. It is divided into eight segments. The information regarding Enlil's journey is found in a segment that fortunately is most undamaged. At the segment's margin starts and constellations are named, indicating the celestial space is out there. The writings on the side suggest landing instructions. In the segment's center, a route is drawn connecting the pictograph for mountainous planet to a segment of the skies familiar with Sumerian astronomy as Earth's location. The route's course takes a turn between two planets whose Sumerian names stand for Jupiter and Mars. And the statement in Akkadian, under the route line, clearly says, the god in Lil went by the planets. There are seven of them accurately counted, since for anyone coming into our solar system from its outer range, Pluto would be the first planet encountered. Neptune and Uranus, second and third. Saturn and Jupiter, fourth and fifth. Mars, sixth, and the Earth, seventh. The change in duties and command structure was, at best, not an easy undertaking. It was doubly difficult to diminish Ea's prerogatives by sending to Earth his rival for the crown in Lil. The bickering and mistrust between the half-brothers is reflected on the one hand by Enki's cry that he is the firstborn, fecund seed, and is now reduced in status, and by Enlil in a second text in a text recording, his complaint that Ea is withholding from him the me, an enigmatic term usually translated divine formulas, some kind of memory chips essential for the aspect of the mission. Others got so bad that I knew himself journeyed to Earth and offered his two sons to settle the issue of succession by drawing lots. We know that, and we know essentially what ensued from the Atrahasis epic. The gods clasped hands together, cast lots, and then divided. I knew their father was the king, and Lil, the warrior, was the commander. I knew went back to heaven. The earth he left to his underlings. The seas enclosed as with a loop. To Enki, the prince, were given. After Anu had gone up to heaven, Enki to the Abzu went down. The text's subsequent 14 lines that certainly dealt with Enlil's domain and tasks are too damaged to be fully read and translated. 
Well, the legible portions of other lines indicate that while Ea renamed Enki, the Lord of the Earth, as a solace, was assigned to the Abzu to oversee the mining operation, Enlil took charge of the Eden, whose two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, are clearly mentioned. We know from other texts that Enlil increased the number of Anunnaki settlements there from Ea Sol Iridu to the famed five cities of the gods and then added three more, Larsa, Nippur, and Lagash. Now this is all pre-flood. We're talking 238,000 years before the Great Flood. And I believe the rock wall to be one of these aforementioned five cities. Nippur, Akkadian for the Sumerian Nibiru, the splendid place of crossing, served as Enlil's mission control center. The Anunnaki built the Ikur, the house which is like a mountain, a temple tower whose head was raised heavenward, its innermost chamber equipped with the tablets of destinies, and humming with other instruments emitting a bluish light served as the Duran Key. That's the Stargate, the bond of heaven and earth. Having been forced to provide Enlil with the essential me material, Enki filled the Ikur abode of Enlil with possessions, and the boats of Malula, transporting gold and silver, brought them to Nippur for Enlil. When the eight settlements are pinpointed on a map, a purposeful layout emerges. Nippur was physically at the center, the others located in concentric distances. They formed a flight corridor leading to Sippar, the spaceport city. It was anchored on the peaks of Mount Ararat, the highest topographical feature in the Middle East, in the Near East. Medical facilities were at Shuparak. Bad Tibiara was the metallurgical center where ores from the Abzu were processed. From Sippar, the ingots were regularly transported in small shipments to Mars. For Mars, with its lesser gravitational pull, served as a space base from which the Anunnaki shipped large and heavier gold loads to Nibiru. Arriving in groups of 50, the Anuna were divided into two groups, 600 henceforth known as the Anunnaki. Those who from heaven to earth came were based and served on earth. Their assignments included mine work in the Abzu and the tasks in the Eden. Another 300, the Agigi, those who observe and see, operated the shuttlecraft between earth and Mars, and their main base was Mars. The setup is depicted on a 4,500-year-old cylinder seal now kept at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. It shows an Anunnaki Eagle Man astronaut on Earth symbolized by seven dots and the moon's crescent, greeting a mask-wearing fish man, the Agigi, on Mars. A circular spacecraft with extended panels is shown in the skies between them. As Mission Earth was in full swing, Nibiru was saved. But on Earth itself, trouble was brewing. So that's the end of Chapter 7. We'll pick up next time with Chapter 8, A Surf Made to Order. Chapter 8, A Surf Made to Order. The unrest among the Agigi that led to the zoo incident was only a prelude to other troubles involving them troubles inherent in long-term interplanetary missions. And the absence of female companionship turned out to be one of the major issues. Oh, here we go. One of the major issues. They don't have nothing to get their dick wet with. Oh, geez. I'm sorry, ladies. Uh, pussy always has to fuck everything up, doesn't it? What, are the, what, what is the number one cause of problems in the world today? It's not war, it's not famine, it's not greed, it's pussy. Pussy causes more problems than anything else. Vaginas have caused empires to fall all, all over the world. You know, they've caused... Kingdoms to fall. Corporations to fall. 
religions to fall. Vagina. Vagina. Oh, but it's so good. Mm. Yep, and that's why it caused so many goddamn problems. Anything that good has got to be bad in some other way. And that's what it is. And these guys were no different. Always got to have something to get your dick wet with or there's going to be problems. And the Anunnaki were no different. Why do you think we're that way? You know? You, you, believe me. I'm speaking from experience here. You can tolerate it for a while, but eventually it's just like, I've got to get my dick wet. Even if I'm going to go in there and fucking uh, get the Jergens out of the, of the, you know, and put it in my hand and, and make it feel like one of those wet weenie things that you used to get when you were a kid. I mean, even if I've got to do that, I'm going to do something to get my dick wet here. Something. Simulation. Somehow. I mean, it just, you know, after a while you just have to do it. The problem was less acute in the case of the Earth stationed Anunnaki, for, the, for there were females among them for the first landing party, some of whom are mentioned by name and, and tasks in Inky's autobiography. I, these are the ones I poured, poured it into. Inky's list of sexual conquests. It's like 5,000 stone tablets worth or something. No, I'm kidding. I'm making that up. It doesn't exist. Maybe it does. I don't know. Additionally, a group of female nurses led by a daughter of Anu were sent to Earth. Her name was Ninma, which means mighty lady. Her task on Earth was that of Sud, the one who gives succor. She served as the Anunnaki's chief medical officer and was destined to play a major role in the many of the subsequent events. But trouble brewed also among the Earth-based Anunnaki, especially among those assigned to mining duties. The Atrahasis epic, in fact, tells the story of a mutiny of the Anunnaki who refused to go on working in the gold mines and the ensuing chain of unintended consequences. The epic ancient title echoed its opening words, Enuma Ilu Awalam, when the gods like men. When the gods like men bore the work of the, and suffered the toil, the toil of the gods was great. The work was heavy. Distress was much. The irony in the title is that the gods toiled as though they were men because there were yet no men on earth. The epic's tales, in fact, the tale of the creation of man to take over the gods' toil. Indeed, the very Akkadian term, awilu, means workman, a toiler, rather than simply man as is usually translated. The feat that changed everything was an accomplishment of Enki and Ninma. But as far as in little was concerned, it was not a tale with a happy ending. As for the Anunnaki miners toiled deep in the mountains, they counted the periods of the toil. For 10 periods, they suffered the toil. For 20 periods, they suffered the toil. For 30 periods, they suffered the toil. For 40 periods, they suffered the toil. Excessive was the toil for 40 periods. They suffered the work night and day. They were complaining, backbiting, grumbling in the excavations. Let us confront the commander that he may relieve us of our heavy work. Let us break the yoke. The occasion for the mutiny was a visit by Enlil to the mining area. Come, let us unnerve him in his dwelling. A ringleader, whose name is ineligible in the tablet, urged the angry miners, let us proclaim a mutiny, let us adopt hostilities in battle. It was nighttime as the mutineers reached the place where Enlil was staying, the gatekeeper, Kalkal, barred the gate and alerted Enlil's aide, Nusku, who awakened his master. Hearing the shouting, which included calls to kill Enlil, Enlil was incredulous. Is it against me that it is being done? What do my own eyes see? Through Nusko, he demanded to know, who is the instigator of this conflict? The mutineers responded by shouting, Every single one of us has declared battle. Our work is heavy. Distress is great. Excessive toil is killing us. When Enlil heard those words, his tears flowed. Contacting Anu, he offered to, re to resign his command and return to Nibiru, but demanded the instigator of the mutiny be done to death. Anu summoned the Council of State. They found that the Anunnaki's complaints were justified. But how could the vital gold supply mission be abandoned? 
It was then that Enki opened his mouth and addressed the gods, his brethren. There is a way out of the dilemma, he said. We will have with us Ninma. She is Belet Ilili, a birth-giving goddess. Let her fashion Alulu. Let Amalu bear the toil of the gods. Let her create Alulu Amilu. Let him bear the yoke. He was suggesting to create Alulu, a mixed one, a hybrid to be and Emelu, a workman, to take over the Anunnaki's toil. And when the other gods asked how such a Lulu Amilu could be created, Inki answered, the creature whose name you uttered already exists. All we need to do is bind on it the image of the gods. And by bind on it the image of the gods, binding their, their DNA with ours. Therein, this response lies the answer to the enigma of the missing link. How could Homo sapiens, modern man, appear in Southeast Africa some 300,000 years ago, overnight, when the evolutionary advances from apes to hominids, and in hominid species from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus, etc., took millions upon millions of years? A being akin to the Anunnaki in many respects, Enki told the astounded gods already exists in the wilds of the Abzu. All we need to do is bind on it the image of the gods to upgrade it with some Anunnaki genes and create a Lulu, a mixed one who could take over the mining work. What Enki had discovered at his headquarters in Southeast Africa was a hominid so akin genetically to the Anunnaki that was some genetic tinkering adding to the genome of the hominid, say a Homo erectus, some Anunnaki genes could upgrade the hominid to the status of an understanding, speaking, tool-handling Homo sapiens. And it was all possible because the DNA on Earth was that of Nibiru, transferred, the reader will recall, when Nibiru itself smashed into Tiamat. Inky then outlined to the assembled leaders how it could be done with the help of Ninma and her biomedical expertise. In the assembly, the great Anunnaki who administered destinies declared yes. That fatal decision to create man is echoed in the Bible, identifying the assembled great Anunnaki as the Elohim, the lofty ones. Genesis 1.26 states, And Elohim said, Let us make an Adam in our image. Our image. Multiple gods, and after our likeness. There is no doubting the plural in the biblical statement, starting with the plural Elohim through let us make in our image, in our likeness. It happened 40 periods, 40 shars after the arrival of the Anunnaki. If the arrival took place some 445,000 years ago, the creation of Adamu took place 300,000 years ago exactly when Homo erectus suddenly changed to Homo sapiens. The process by which the fashioning of the primitive worker was achieved is then described in the Atrahasis epic, as well as in several other works it involved obtaining from the blood of a god his teima, a term scholars translate as personality or life essence, and mixing it with the t-it of the abzu. The term T-it has been presumed to come from the Akkadian word tit, which means clay. Hence the notion echoed in the Bible that the atom was fashioned from clay or dust of the earth. But read in its Sumerian origin, T-it means that which is with life, the essence of a life of a living being. The Taima, the life's essence or personality of a god, what we now define as his genetic DNA, was mixed with the essence of an existing being found in the area just above the Abzu. By mixing genes extracted from the blood of a god with the essence of an existing earthly being, the atom was genetically engineered. There was no missing link in our jump from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens because the Anunnaki jumped the gun on evolution through genetic engineering. The task described by Enki was easier said than done. In addition to the Atrahasis epic, other texts detail the creation process, extensively rendered in both the 12th planet and Genesis Revisited. Always got to get his little plugs in there for his other books. 
They describe considerable trial and error resulting in beings missing limbs with defective or odd organs or with flawed eyesight or other senses. As the experiments continued, Ninma figured out which genes affect what and declared that she now could deliberately produce, as my heart desires, beings with or without this or that defect. Inki, a text states, prepared a purifying bath into which one god was bled. Ninma mixed blood and flesh in order to fix upon the newborn the image of the gods. Enki was seated before her. He was prompting her with instructions and advice. The genetic endeavor was conducted in the Bit Shimiti, a laboratory-like place whose Sumerian name, Shimt, literally meant place where the wind of life is blown in, a detail from which the biblical verse about blowing the breath of life into the Adam's nostrils, Genesis 2-7, was in all probability taken. Ninma was handling the mixing, reciting the incantations. Ninma was listening for an upu, a heartbeat, when the perfect model was finally attained. Ninma lifted him and shouted, I have created. My hands have made it. Announcing the feat to the great gods, here is what she said. You commanded me a task. I have completed it. I have removed your heavy work. I have imposed your toil on Awilam, the workman. You raised a cry for Alawiti, mankind. I took off your yoke. I established your freedom. When the gods heard this speech of hers, they ran together and kissed her feet. They called her Mamie, the mother, and renamed her Ninti, the lady of life. The solution suggested by Ea was achieved. The genes were got the genes we got were those of a male Anunnaki. Later discovered in the Atrahasis tablets reveal that he was the leader of the mutiny. But with all due respect to a male god or god, it was a female goddess who would actually create us. Now that's interesting. So the blood I've talked about this before. And that just confirms for me my thoughts. That's why humans are so hard to enslave. That's why we rebel against enslavement. Anytime someone tries to treat us like an indentured servant or a slave, we, we re- rebel against it. We want to break away from that. That's because we were spawned. Oh, that's amazing. So they went, and found, they went and found the one guy who was protesting the, the hard toil and labor and who wanted to change things. I mean, that's where this rebellious spirit and this, this spirit to, to change the, the status quo that's in all of us really comes from. So instead of just randomly killing this guy for being a troublemaker, they put his essence into every one of us. So that any time anyone ever attempted to enslave us or put us in a state of being that was below our stature, we would fight back. And I think that's where that fighting spirit in us comes from today. That's an amazing piece of information. I never heard that before. It required additional genetic engineering, even some surgery under anesthesia, reported both in a Sumerian text and in the Bible, to fashion a female counterpart. But like hybrids to this day, such as a mule, the mixed product of a horse and a donkey, they could not procreate to make copies of the perfect model of the Lulu, Amilu. Difficult and time-consuming reproduction by young birth goddesses was required. The next step of genetic engineering enabling the Lulus to procreate on their own was undertaken by Enki, the serpent in the biblical Garden of Eden version. This is why they have labeled Enki, people believe Enki is the devil. And it's the most retarded, complete aberration of the facts I've ever heard. Enki started the first secret society ever because he saw that in creating this new race, it would be very easy for them to be tricked and fooled and and to be enslaved. That's why 
as I just said, he gave us this blood of this person that was rebelling. In case anyone ever came along and tried to enslave us, we would have this natural ability to want to strike back against that. That's why he created the Brotherhood of the Snake. To teach mankind who we are, where we come from, our history and everything. And then that got corrupted and taken over by the priests and used as a, as a form of control. And because he attempted to do this, when the elders found out, they banished him to reincarnate in fragile human bodies over and over again. Each time being labeled as the king of darkness, the prince of darkness, Beelzebub, Satan, Lucifer, the dark one. And then Christianity just took that and convoluted the whole thing so you never even find out what the real meaning of that was and why Inky was given that serpent symbology. As the biblical tale has it, the Adam who was placed in the orchard of the gods to till it and to tend it was warned by God. The Hebrew term is actually Yahweh Elohim, not to eat from the tree of knowing, for on the day that you eat thereof, surely you, sh you shall die. Put into deep sleep, the Adam is operated upon, and a counterpart female is fashioned from his rib. The Adam and the woman, she is not yet named, go about naked and are not ashamed. The wily serpent now approaches the woman regarding the prohibited tree, and she confirms what that is what Elohim had said. But the serpent said to the woman, no, you will not die. So the woman, seeing that the tree's fruit was edible, took of this fruit and ate it and also gave it to her mate right there. The reason that's associated with Enki being the serpent is because he had to get these two to fuck. And that's where this whole guilt of sex and all this stuff comes. It's so ridiculous. You know, the church using sex, you know, oh, blah, blah, you got to keep yourself pure until this age and all this bullshit. Just, you know, that's where it comes from. He needed to get them to mate. He needed them get, to get their fuck on. And the only way that he could do that was to get Eve to tempt Adam so that they could procreate and make their, their worker race they were trying to create. But we've been said, sold this lie of religion and sin, and oh, we're sinful creatures. We're not sinful creatures. I mean, you always hear religion people, Christians say, oh, we're born into sin, and we're born into it, and we're all sinful. Boy, that's a great attitude to have, isn't it? I thought all you had to do was ask God for forgiveness, and you were forgiven. That's what they always say, too. But we couldn't, somebody couldn't have already asked God for permission, you know, to ask him, hey, can we get a little forgiveness here? For being uh, born into sin? Oh, no, that can't happen. That's a contradiction of the Christian faith. Okay. It's all bullshit. Mankind was not born into sin. We were born out of necessity. And that was the only way they could do it. And that's where this whole bullshit <coughs> notion of love comes about to this day. That's why love is so closely associated with hormones, the feeling of love, because that's been in us from day one. They had to engineer this thing, this mindset, this really mind control thing called love to get our hormones to work in a way that would cause us to reproduce and propagate the species. That's why this thing of love and how we kill for it and, 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 and you know, go to great lengths for it, is such... I mean, I'm not saying don't love people, and I don't love people. I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that's why it's not the same as what you see in nature. Because it was something that was introduced to us in order to get us to propagate our species. And right away they became aware of their sexuality, realizing that they were naked. They made themselves aprons out of fig leaves. It was those aprons that gave them away. For the next time Yahweh Elohim saw them, he noticed that they were no longer naked. Questioning the Adam about it, he found out what had happened and angered 
What have you done? God shouted at the woman. Because of that, in pain and suffering, you, were be- you were- will bear children. Alarmed. Yeah, see, no, <laughs> this is completely ridiculous. Behold, the Adam has become one of us to know good and evil. What if he put forth his hand and took also the tree of life and ate? It lived forever. And God expelled the Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The tale without a doubt explains how Adam and Eve were unable to procreate. A development blamed in the Bible on the serpent, the Hebrew word for which is nakash, which could also mean he who solves puzzles. Not surprisingly, the Sumerian parallel for these varied meanings also comes from a single term, bazur, which was an epithet of enki, meaning he who solves secrets. The hieroglyph for Ptah, his Egyptian name, was an entwined serpent. In the Mesopotamian text, Enki was assisted in the secret knowledge by his son, Ningizida, who's also Toth, whose emblem, entwined serpents, has remained without a doubt the symbol of medicine to this day. These name meanings and entwined serpent symbols are echoed in the biblical tale of the serpent and the two special trees in the Garden of Eden. And now that modern science has discovered the structure of DNA strands, it is possible to realize that Ningazita's emblem of the two entwined serpents is, in fact, a rendering of the two-stranded entwined double helix DNA. We demonstrate their similarities in figure 67. Out of the gods' blood, they fashioned mankind. The text reiterate. They imposed on it the tasks to let the free, to let free the gods. It was a work beyond comprehension. Indeed it was, and it happened some 300,000 years ago, just when Homo sapiens suddenly appeared in Southeast Africa. It was then that the Anunnaki jumped the gun on evolution and used genetic engineering, upgraded a hominid, say Homo erectus, to an intelligent tool-handling Homo sapien, to be their serf. It happened in the area above the Abzu, exactly where the fossil remains indicate, in the Great Rift Valley Zone of Southeast Africa, just north of the gold mining land. We know from the continuing Atrahasis text and from other detailed texts that no time was lost in putting the primitive workers to work in the mines and that the Anunnaki from the settlements in the Eden raided the mines and forcefully brought some of the workers to serve them in the Eden, where with picks and spades they built the shrines. They built the canal banks, they grew food for the people and for the sustenance of the gods. The Bible, though, more briefly reports the same, and Yahweh, Elohim, took the Adam from where he had been created and placed him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to tend it. The Bible specifically precedes here, Adam, he of earth, an earthling, with the definitive article, the, making it clear that it is a species that is written about, is distinct from a person named Adam, husband of Eve, whose tale starts only in chapter 4 of Genesis. To till it and to tend it. To be an emelu, a workman. The Bible has similarly stated, Adam, lay amal yulad, Adam to toil was created, and the Hebrew term avad, translated worship, in the truth means to work. Man was fashioned by the gods to be their serf. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that statement right there pretty much sums it all up for me. I mean, you can wrap up the entire world system today with that statement. Man was fashioned by the gods to be their serf. Period. End of story. We were fashioned by the gods to be their serfs. But that doesn't mean that that's our fate. That doesn't mean that that's what we have to reside ourselves to, but it seems that we, as a species, have resided ourselves to that, haven't we? Just because that's what we were made and intended for doesn't mean that has to be our fate. We don't have to be anyone's serf if we don't want to. That's why they've created this thing now where people just go into serfdom willfully. 
They don't even fight against it anymore. But as that story we read last night, this guy in Arkansas wants to start, you know, capital punishment for those troublemakers, those ones who, I guess, have the personalities of not wanting to be a serf, and so we weed those out because, you know, they happen ever so many and ever so human incarnations. You know, they, they probably got it down to a specific number now. It's probably one in 12 or something, you know, or one in one in 50 or something. One in 50 is a troublemaker, born a troublemaker, so we need to start finding a way to weed those out. Well, I made it through, motherfucker. And y'all did everything y'all could when I was in the public school system to try and keep me from, from, from making it, but guess what? I got a microphone, I got a worldwide audience, and I won't be stopped. Time passed, the settled land extended, and the people multiplied. Thus does the Atra Hases epic start. The next phase of the events that followed the mutiny and the creation of the Adam that finally led to the deluge. The people, in fact, multiplied so much that the land was bellowing like a bull. Enlil was not happy. The god was disturbed by their commotion. He made his displeasure known. Enlil heard their bellowing and said to the great gods, The bellowing of mankind has become too intense for me. By their commotion, I am deprived of sleep. Of the damaged lines that follow only Enlil's words, let there be a plague are legible, but we know from the parallel biblical narrative that Yahweh repented that he had made the Adam on earth and said, I will wipe the Adam that I have created off the face of the earth. The tale of the deluge and its hero is told in both sources among similar, along similar lines, except that unlike the monotheistic Bible, where the same God first decides to destroy mankind and then saves it through Noah, The Mesopotamian version clearly identifies Enlil as the angry deity while it is Enki defying Enlil who saves the seed of mankind. On the other hand, the biblical narrative which compresses all the deities into a soul god, right, that's because of the monotheistic, that's all because of the Ra thing, provides a more profound reason then bellowing or commotion for the dissatisfaction with mankind. In the words of chapter 6 of Genesis, it came to pass that when the Adam began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of the Elohim saw the daughters of men and that they were suitable, they took them as wives of which they chose. Boom, bingo, bam, snip, zip, snap, zitty, bam, pip, pop, ping. Right there, motherfucker, that's it. The bellowing... And moaning that it Lil was referencing, oh yeah, you guessed it, not even trying to be funny. That's what, uh, 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 that was the sound of straight pouring, motherfucker. And Lil couldn't sleep because these motherfuckers were getting their fuck on. And he was pissed. They took them as wives, all of which they chose. This is, and this ties. 100% into the story of Atlantis because remember this is all all pre-flood stuff well the the tales of Atlantis tell the same thing that humans were considered animals we were considered beasts of burden as you would consider livestock cows, horses, anything else to be beasts of burden right? that's what they just talked about Right? Creating us to be serfs. Man was fashioned by the gods to be their serf. Right? Same thing that the story of Atlantis tells. Mankind coexisted with the gods on earth during the time of Atlantis in these cities all over the earth for 238,000 years before the flood, which I believe the rock wall is one of these cities. And when the Gods tried to set up the first brotherhood of man and they started interbreeding specifically. One of their main rules of Atlantis was was interbreeding was forbidden. I'm sorry, not interbreeding. uh, Bestiality was forbidden. We, We think about bestiality as having sex with a horse or fucking a dog or chicken fucker or whatever else it may be. But 
we, we don't think about it in terms of us being the animals for the purview of a more evolved being the gods. And so when the sons of the Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were suitable and they took them as wives, of which they chose, this angered the gods in Lil. He couldn't sleep because of the moaning and groaning. They were getting their fuck on. And this is when the bestiality, the result of the bestiality was us. So, congratulations, humanity. We are the bestiality baby shit out of the vagina of a human animal that got fucked and impregnated by a god. So I guess we're, we're, we're half gods. Half god, half animal. That's what we are, essentially. We're half god, half animal. And, uh, you know, there'd be a big problem, I think, on this planet, literally overnight, if everybody knew that was the case. Imagine if everybody tomorrow found out they were half god. I'm a god, motherfucker. Oh, hell yeah. Come here, bitch. I, I mean, I know I would. I don't know why I don't do that now. I mean, if this ever gets out, it's going to be on. I tell you what. I'm just going to be rolling up chicks in bars. Hey, baby, what's up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I put my penis in you right here. Yeah, I'm a god. Woo. You like that? Yeah. I'm half god, baby. You're a half animal. Let's do this. Oh, my goodness. So this, I mean, this, this is exactly all this on an Aki. I don't, I don't know why anybody doesn't talk more about this. I mean, all of this stuff that's that from the Sumerian texts. This is exactly the story of what happened in Atlantis. These, the Anunnaki were the Atlanteans. How come nobody ever talks about that? I mean, I'm sure somebody out there probably does, but it seems to me, from what I've read, the stuff I'm looking at, most people are not put, are not putting that together. These are the same people. So Enlil couldn't sleep because they were getting their fuck on. And then, uh, boy, I, you know, the gods were pissed when they saw that they, they shit out some half on a knocky, half, you know, surf work. I mean, that's like, I mean, my goodness, that's like, you know, some racist piece of shit white person, you know, looking at their daughter shitting out, you know, a half black, half white kid. And being disgusted by it and wanting them all wiped out. Well, that's that's pretty much what we came from. Our whole species came from that. You wonder why there's people that still act like that in the world today when that's what we came from as a species, as a people. We came from that. Oh my God, it's a half breed. What do you think in, in all of the science fiction stories you look at? God damn, there's a million of them. I mean, old, new, in between, doesn't matter. How many science fiction stories are there, ladies and gentlemen, where it's always the half breed who ends up being the savior of all people? There's on all movies, it's always the half human, half alien guy who is the savior. Or the half evil, half good guy, or, or whatever it may be. How, I mean, how many movies are there and TV shows and everything else? You could probably think of a hundred off the top of your head. Yahweh, Genesis tells us, was angered by what was going on. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And Yahweh repented that he had made the Adam on earth and it grieved his heart. And he said, I will wipe the Adam that I've created off the face of the earth. The instrument of destruction was the coming deluge. This, then, was the wickedness that troubled Enlil. The intermarriage between the sons of gods and female earthlings, an intermarriage not between different races of the same species, but between two different planetary species, a practice that Enlil, a by-the-book disciplinarian, considered an absolute taboo. He was angered by the fact that it was none other than Enki, who was first to break the taboo by having sex with female earthlings. Ah, get your pour on. 
earthlings, and he was especially infuriated by the fact that Enlil's son Marduk was went ahead and actually took as a wife one such earthly. <laughs> well, that was a bad sneeze. Sorry, folks. Oh, man. Whew. Setting, in Enlil's opinion, a perverted example to the rank and file Anunnaki. There was more to it. The forbidden liaisons produced children. We continue to read in Genesis 6. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of the Elohim came unto the daughters of the Adam and bore children to them. No wonder that the great disciplinarian said, I will wipe the Adam that I created off the face of the earth. Setting aside the morals or rules that should govern interplanetary visitations, the basic problem raised by these Mesopotamian by uh, Mesopotamian biblical tales of our origins is this. How could the intermarried Anunnaki males and earthling females have children? A result from mating that requires astounding genomic capability, especially in the X female and Y male chromosomes. Indeed, taking the puzzle to its beginnings, how could the wild hominid of the Abzu have the same DNA that the Anunnaki had, similar enough so that just a little genetic mixing could produce a being that, according to the Sumerians and the Bible, was akin to the gods both inwardly and outwardly, except for their longevity. The puzzle deepens by the fact that not only human, not only mammalian, not only all animal, but all life on earth from birds to fishes, flora to algae, and down to bacteria and viruses, all have the same, very same DNA. The four nucleic acid letters from which all genes and genomes are made up that means that the DNA of the Anunnaki matched the DNA of all life on Earth. And if, as should be assumed, the DNA of the Anunnaki was the same as the DNA of all life on Nibiru, then we must conclude that the DNA on planet Earth and the DNA on planet Nibiru were the same. How could that be if, according to the dominant modern scientific theory, the Earth sea served as a mixing bowl in which basic chemical molecules bumping into each other and heated by geysers, somehow combined into living cells. The nucleic acid that combined to form DNA, modern scientists explain, had come about as a result of random bumping of chemical molecules in some random primordial watery soup until the first living random cell happened. But if so, then the random result here had to be different from the random result elsewhere, for no two planets or even moons in our one solar system are identical and the odds that the random outcome would nevertheless be identical are virtually nil. So how did life on Earth begin if it is so similar to Nibiru's? The answer was given in the very tale of the celestial battle when in the second round, Nibiru, Marduk, trod upon and came into actual contact with Tiamat, severing her veins and thrusting away her skull, the future Earth. It was then that the seed of life, the DNA of life on Nibiru, was transferred to planet Earth. Science's primordial soup theory, whether or not valid in respect to any planetary environment elsewhere, runs into acknowledge additional problems when it comes to Earth. Abandoning the notion that the solar system has not changed a bit since it began to take shape some 4.5 billion years ago, modern science now acknowledges that something extraordinary happened about 3.9 billion years ago. In the words of the New York Times, in the Science of the Times, June 16th, 2009, some 3.9 billion years ago, a shift in the orbit of the sun's outer planets sent a surge of large comets and asteroids careening into the inner solar system. I believe that's what's going on right now. Their violent impacts gouged out the large crater still visible on the moon's face, heated Earth's surface into molten rock, and boiled off its oceans into an incandescent mist. Yet rocks that formed on Earth 3.8 billion years ago were almost as soon as the bombardment had stopped, stopped contained possible evidence of biological processes. The impossibility of life starting here in such circumstances, the New York Times stated, has frustrated researchers so much that some scientists as eminent as Francis Crick 
chief theorists of molecular biology have quietly suggested that life may have formed elsewhere before seeding our planet. The theory that life on Earth was seeded from elsewhere, known as the panspermia theory, was fully discussed in my 1990 book, Genesis Revisited, where it was, of course, pointed out that the inexplicable, 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 I can see that word, mm, inexplicable catastrophic event 3.9 billion years ago was the tale of Nibiru and the celestial battle. The panspermia solution is neither quietly held, though not adopted by the scientific establishment. Its proponents include many prominent scientists, nor is it new. It was put forth in cuneiform clay tablets millennia ago. Life on Earth and life on Nibiru, DNA on Earth and DNA on Nibiru is the same because the seed of life was imparted by Nibiru to Earth during the celestial battle. The obtainment of such a ready-made seed of life explains how life could begin on Earth in the relatively immediate aftermath of the cataclysm. Since Nibiru, at the time of the collision, already possessed formed DNA, evolution began there much earlier than thought. One cannot say how much earlier, but in terms of 4.5 billion years, just 1% earlier would mean a head start of uh, 45 million Earth years. More than enough evolutionary time for Nibiru's astronauts to meet a Homo erectus on Earth. The ancient notion that life on Earth began when it was seeded from Nibiru was further expressed in the concept of an actual seed of life, Numan in Sumerian, Zeru in Akkadian, Zera in Hebrew. The basic scientific idea not only explained how life on Earth originated, it also pointed to where on Earth life began. It is noteworthy that in Genesis 1, 20 to 25, the Bible describes the evolution of living things on the fifth day of creation as proceeding from the waters to dry land, progressing from all that creeps in the waters through amphibians to the great lizards, dinosaurs, followed by birds and then to all other living creatures and their kind, a veritable ancient theory of evolution whose sequence is impressive in accord with modern theories of evolution, including the most recent findings that birds evolved from dinosaurs, avian reptiles. But when it concerns where life on Earth started, the Bible precedes marine life with an earlier phase. On day three, according to the Bible, life began with the appearance of seed-bearing grasses on dry land. It was after the formation of raised continents and water-filled seas that God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seeds, and the fruit tree that yields fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself and and it was so upon the earth. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So while in other verses the Bible describes evolution as we know it, from primitive marine to fishes to amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, the Bible also asserts that before all that creepeth began to stir in the waters, herbage uh, herbage bearing and stemming from seeds was the first phase of life on Earth. Such a distinction between the evolution of life and the start of life on Earth has long been held as contradicting modern science until the publication in July 2009 in Nature magazine of a revolutionary study according to which a thick green carpet of photosynthetic life exploded across the earth hundreds of millions of years before life with oxygen-hungry cells appearing in the waters. Earth, the scientific journal announced, was greened over with a thick carpet of plant life whose sediments, when washed into the oceans, may have nourished watery life. These new revolutionary findings restate what was stated in the Bible millennia earlier. This sequence, the Bible makes clear, was made possible by the seed aspect of the grasses. The word seed, seed bearing, are often repeated and repeated six times in the two quoted verses, making sure that the reader does not miss the point. Life on earth began with and from a seed 
of ready-made DNA. Through a parallel specific Mesopotamian text has not thus far been found. Other clues indicate that such a sequence of life's beginnings from herbal seeds had been noted by the Sumerians. We find the evidence in the words and terminology of the 50 divine names that were granted to Marduk when he assumed supremacy. Retained in their original Sumerian form, even in the Babylonian text, each name was followed by text lines elaborating its meaning of immediate relevance to our subject are the following seven epithet names that we list as they appear on the tablet together with their textual elucidations. Maru Uka, verily the, the God creator of all. Nama Tilaku, the God who sustains life. Asaru, bestower of cultivation, creator of herbs and grains who causes vegetation to sprout. Epidun, Lord who sprinkles the field, who establishes seed rows. Serser, who heaped up a mountain over Tiamat, whose hair is a grain field. Gil, who heaps grain in massive mounds, who brings forth barley and millet, who furnishes the seed of earth. Gish Nunabab, the creator of the primeval seed, the seed of all people. The above sequence of attributes conforms to the Anunnaki's theory of both the origin of life on Earth and its evolutionary stages. According to it, the celestial Marduk, alias Nibiru, is A, the creator of the primeval seed, B, who furnished the seed of Earth, beginning with herbs and vegetation that sprouts, and C, culminating with providing the seed of all people. It is a notion of all life stemming from the same seed, the same DNA in a chain leading from Nibiru's primeval seed to the seed of all people. In this concept, a scientific conclusion of the Anunnaki lies centrally of their preoccupation with the seed as the essence of life. When Enlil wished to have mankind perish in the deluge, it was the seed of mankind that Enlil wished to destroy. When Enki revealed the secret of the flood to Zisudra, he told him that a deluge will be sent to destroy the seed of mankind. And it was not actual pairs of all animals that Noah, a.k.a. Untapushtim, took on board the ark. In addition to some sheep and birds, it was the seed of living things provided by Enki that was aboard DNA. As stated in the Epic of Gilgamesh, those were the instructions to Utnapishtim, man of Shurupak, son of Ubar Tutu, tear down the house, build a ship, give up possessions, seek thou life, forswear belongings, keep soul alive, aboard ship, take thou the seed of all living things. In the list of 50 names, Marduk's epithets with the term seed in them range from he who establishes seed rows, and those could be bloodlines, he who establishes the bloodlines, the rows could mean, you know, the, the, the lines, the rows are lines and the bloodlines. To he who furnishes the seed of earth, creator of the primeval seed and the seed of all people. We can still hear the reverberating outcry of Ia Enki. I am the leader of the Anunnaki, engendered by fecund seed, the firstborn son of Devon, divine An. And we must recall in Lil's superseding claim to the right of succession, the fact that because his mother, Antu, was a half-sister of Anu, Enlil's seed was doubly fecunded. So of whose seed is man? The issue of our genetic origins is no longer a subsequent of biblical studies. It has moved from the realms of faith and philosophy to the area of sophisticated science. For the latest research is zeroing in on the seemingly immortal cancer cells 
that the obviously fundamental stem cells, the embryonic cells from which all other body cells evolve. In the biblical narrative, humanity stems in direct lineage from Adam and Eve and their son Seth through the sole surviving family of Noah and his three married sons. But even the Bible acknowledges the existence of another human lineage, the line of Cain, that flourished in some faraway land of Nod. Judging from the Sumerian and Akkadian sources, the actual story is considerably more complex and touches upon the issue of life, longevity, and mortality. Above all, it involves the demigods, offspring of the taking by the gods of the daughters of man as wives. Details how Sumir's capital was first in the city of Kish, then moved to Uruk and to Ur, and then changed to Awan, returned to Kish, transferred to Hamazi, returned to Uruk, and then to Ur, and so on, ending in the city called Isin. The last entry dates the document to a king named Utu Hagal, who reigned in Uruk circa 2120 BC, more than 4,100 years ago. But those kings. The prism text clearly states, began to reign only after the deluge, when kingship was lowered again from heaven. The initial portion of the prism lists kings in five pre-diluvial cities of the gods, assigning to each ruler links of reign that baffle scholars. This is what it says. Nam Lugal. When kingship from heaven was lowered. Irida ki nam lugala. In Iridu was kingship. Irida ki alum lim lagal. In Iridu alum was king. MU 28,800 uh, 28, IA. 28,800 years ago he reigned. Al- Algar, 36,000 years reigned. Lugal, two kings. It's 64,800 years reigned. I mean, this is all pre-flood. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years of reign of these gods before the Great Deluge. And see, this is becoming clearer and clearer to me what this whole rock wall thing is. This is one of, this is one of the cities that, that was reigned over before the, uh, before the flood happened. And continued in translation only, Iridu was dropped, kingship to Bad Tibiara was carried. In Bad Tibiara, Inme in Lu Ana reigned 43,200 years. Inme Engal Ana reigned 28,800 years. Demuzi, a shepherd, reigned 36,000 years. Three kings reigned a total of 108,000 years. Bad TBR was dropped. Kingship to Larak was carried. In Larak, in Sapanzi Ana reigned 28,800 years. One king reigned its 28,800 years. Larak was dropped. Kingship to Sapar was carried. In Sapar, Inme Indura Ana became king and reigned for 21,000 years. Sipar was destroyed. Its kingship to Shiparak was carried. In Chupark, Ubar Tutu became king and reigned its 18,600 years. Five cities they were, eight kings reigned 241,200 years. The flood swept there over. So they had eight kings in five cities that reigned for 241,200 years before the great flood, the deluge. No wonder, no wonder scholars are baffled by that text. Hello? See, this, this gives me a greater understanding of what it is that we're looking at here. Because everybody's, you know, that's always been the question about the rock wall thing to me. Is, is that, you know, there seems to be, you know, a connection to these Anunnaki types. But also the evidence shows that this was all ha- happening and all built before the Great Flood. So, 
I think there's been questions as to whether or not the Anunnaki were around on Earth before the Great Flood. I think the common widely held belief is that they were not. But, uh, well, according to this, they indeed were. And they, the, the, the survivors and the remnants of that are the ones that set up the rest of their... Uh, you know, it's, that, that, it, it makes me wonder... You know, the rock wall being on the 33rd degree parallel, they say when that, after the flood, it first, you know, boom, it was it came to life there in Samir. That was the first city that was erected after the Great Flood. And, you know, with, um, just I can't help but wonder and think that if the rock wall specifically being built on the 33rd degree parallel was one of the cities that was reigned over for 241,200 years, as it says here, and as, as it says in this uh, text that's in the museum at Oxford that was donated by this guy in 1923, that it would make complete and utter sense, ladies and gentlemen, that the remnant of that civilization who had to flee their, their lands and flee their uh, cities because of the Great Flood, it makes complete and utter sense that they would rebuild their new Civilization and their new society after the flood, where smack dab on the 33rd degree parallel yet again in ancient Sumeria. I mean, it says in the Sumerian text that before they came to Earth, they came, they went to Mars, right? Remember? They set up shop with the Agigi there. They even had a burial in one of the caves of, uh, and one of the, and even one of the Sumerian texts, I mean, uh, talks about, you know, them. When kingship was brought down to heaven, chapter five. Cities, urban centers of population, are a hallmark of advanced civilization. The Sumerian tablet that relates the tale of the first five cities on Earth is thus the record of the start of advanced civilizations on Earth. Cities imply specialization between farming and industry, they have buildings and streets and marketplaces. Develop commerce and trade, entail transportation and communications. Need record keeping, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They also require an organized society and laws. They have an administrative hierarchy, appoint or, or anoint a chief executive. In Samir and thereafter virtually everywhere else, that was a Lugal, literally a big man rendered king in translation. The Sumerians denoted these elements of advanced knowledge and the sum total of civilization in the term Nam Lugala, a term usually translated kingship. And kingship, the Sumerians asserted, was brought down to earth from the heavens. Held to be a divine institution, kingship required that the king, to be legitimate, had to be chosen or actually anointed by the gods. Accordingly, throughout the ancient world, the succession of kings was meticulously recorded in king lists. In Egypt, as we have seen, they were arranged by dynasties. In Babylonia and Assyria, in Elam and Hatti, and Persia and beyond, and in the Bible with its two book of kings, the king lists named successive rulers giving their lengths of reign and occasionally a brief bi biographical note. In Sumer, where kings ruled in numerous city-states, the main list was arranged by the royal cities that served as a land's central or national capital at any given time, a function that rotated from one major city to another. And Sumer's most famous and best-preserved king list begins with the statement, quote, When kingship was brought down from heaven, a statement that matches the opening verses of the tale of the pre-diluvial cities of the gods that we have just quoted. After the blank of kingship was brought down from heaven, and after the lofty crown and throne of kingship were lowered from heaven. Those assertions, it should be clear, were not meant just to enshrine kingship with divine status. A fundamental tenet of Sumerian history and teachings was that kingship was actually, and not just figuratively, brought down to earth from the heavens. 
that the Anunnaki, those who from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth came, actually began their civilized presence on earth in five settlements, as stated in tablet CBS 10673. Though the name of the God who made the grants is missing in that tablet, one can say with certainty that it was in Lil who followed Inki in coming to earth, a detail recognized by the statement that the first of these cities, Iridu, to the leader, New Dimid, who was also Ea or Inki, was given. Furthermore, each one of the others who were granted a city, New Gig, the moon god, Nanar Sin, Pablasog, who is also Ninurta, Utu, who was Shamash, and Sud, the medic, Ninma, was not just a high-ranking member of the Sumerian pantheon, but was related to Enlil. It was after Enlil's arrival that Inki's initial outpost, Iridu, was expanded to five, then eight full-fledged settlements. The connection between those first of cities of, of the gods and the bringing down of civilization to earth from the heavens is restated in several other Sumerian documents dealing with pre-diluvial events. Two of the key documents can be seen by anyone who visits the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford, England, a museum that traces its beginning to the donation in 1683 by Elias Ashmole of 12 cartloads of antiquarian collectibles that the official history of the museum describes as a Noah's Ark of rarities. The original collection diversified and grew over the centuries to become an official institution of the University of Oxford. Throngs do not wait in line to enter it. It has no Mona Lisa to attract multitudes or movie makers, but among the objects that it houses are two priceless archaeological finds of utmost importance to the history of mankind and our planet. And both record the deluge, alias Noah's Flood, cataloged as WB62 and WB444 by Stephen Langdon in Oxford editions of Cuneiform Text, 1923. The two clay Sumerian artifacts belong to the private collection that Herbert Weld Blundell, an English journalist, explorer, and archaeologist, donated to the museum in 1923. WB444 is better known as the better known of the two, while WB62 looks like the usual kind of clay tablet. WB444 is a rare, remarkable, and beautiful four-sided prism of baked clay. Known as the Sumerian king list, it detuge. In earthly years, that would be 432,000, a statement matching the 10 kings of 120 shards of Barossus and the Sumerian king list. Such a recollection of a pre-diluvial era of the gods can explain the fact that the number 432,000 has been associated with divine duration in varied cultures well beyond the boundaries of Mesopotamia. It forms, for example, the core of Hindu tra traditions about the ages of the yugas, of earth, mankind, and the gods. The Kata Yuga, the great yuga of 4,320,000 years, was divided into four yugas, whose diminishing links were expressions of 432,000 years. The golden four, four, fourfold age, 432,000 times four. The threefold age of knowledge, 432,000 times three. The twofold age of sacrifice, 432,000 times two. And finally, our own present era, the age of discord. 432,000 times 1. According to the Egyptian priest Mantheo, the duration of the world was 2,160,000 years. That equals five eras of 432,000, or 500 Shar years, 3,600 years times 500, which is 2,160,000. <coughs> uh, let me get a drink real quick. The day of the Lord Brahma of four million four billion three hundred and twenty million years equaled one thousand great yugas. 
reminding one of the biblical statements that in the eyes of a God, a thousand years are just as one day. In Hamlet's Mill, 1977, professors Giorgio Di Santia and Hertha von Deschen cite additional instances of 432,000 serving as the point where myth and science join up. Modern scientific discoveries that have been presented in detail in Genesis Revisited and Divine Encounters had led me to conclude that the Great Flood was a huge tidal wave caused by the slippage of the ice sheet off Antarctica. The elimination of that ice box, I have suggested, caused the abrupt end of the last ice age circa 13,000 years ago. The continent of Antarctica was discovered only in 1820, yet it was already shown on the 1513 map of the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis as described in Divine Encounters. The slippage also explains the puzzle of other pre-discovery mappus mundi, such as the 1531 Arantis Phineas map that shows Antarctica as though seen from the air and ice-free. The contours of the Antarctic continent under the ice cover were determined by radar and other modern means only in 1958. The abrupt end of the last ice age has been the subject of numerous studies, including an intensive investigation during the 1958 International Geophysical Year. The studies confirmed both the abruptness and timing about 13,000 years ago of the ice age's ending in Antarctica but left unexplained the reasons for the phenomenon. Additional recent studies support those conclusions. A study of ancient temperatures determined that while warming at the end of the last ice age was relatively gradual in Greenland, it was rapid and abrupt in Antarctica about 13,000 years ago. Another study of ancient sea levels confirming that Antarctica's ice sheet collapsed abruptly, concluded that due to the topography of the continent and its surrounding seabeds, the tidal wave was at least three times higher than heretofore calculated, reaching its maximum impact some 2,000 miles away. A diagram accompanying the article shows the area of maximal tidal impact stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea and northeast therefrom the very lands of the Bible, all the way to Mount Ararat. A deluge date circa 13,000 years ago, at about 10,950 B.C., also dovetails with statements in cuneiform texts that the deluge occurred in the age of the lion, that zodiacal age indeed began circa 11,000 B.C. Adding 432,000 plus 13,000, we can thus confidently say that kingship was brought down to earth from the heavens roughly 445,000 years ago. Now that's interesting because we've seen a lot of numbers pertaining to 500,000 years ago on the rock wall and that kind of thing. It was then that astronauts from another planet whom the Sumerians called Anunnaki arrived on earth. They were the biblical Anakim and the Nephilim of Genesis 6. The various lists of pre-diluvial rulers unanimously agree that Eridu was the first city etching this guy's face in the mountain, that Mars was the way station, and the place on Mars where uh, they found these, you know, these pyramid objects and the supposed face on Mars, which is called Cydonia, is also on the 33rd degree parallel, and subsequently... The ancient name for that area of Mesopotamia and Iraq and Sumer was called Sidonia as well, and it was smack dab on the 33rd degree parallel. I mean, I knew there had to have been a connection to why, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I, I talked about this on the show, you know, with this the quarry and down there at Lake Buchanan and all that and Berger Hill and that whole thing that I found. Why didn't, if they, if they, if there was nothing special about this building, why didn't they just build it? right close to where they had the material, which is uh, about four hours away. Because four hours away was not on the 33rd degree parallel. So they brought these stones four hours away, 
mixed them into the mortar in, in the style that they needed with the right uh, proportions, created this massive rock wall structure. And then when the flood came and they packed up shop and had to leave all that behind, they flew through the air on a direct line on the 33rd degree parallel, which you can navigate all the way around the earth on. And guess what else is on the 33rd degree parallel? Roswell. And it's been speculated that that's why you have so many UFO sightings along the 33rd degree parallel, because they're flying around the earth at that, at that degree. I mean, is this why 33 is so significant and special to the Masons? I mean, I absolutely think that that's the entire reason. They just packed up shop and they moved to the first location they found on the next 33rd degree parallel that looked good. The usual rendering of WB-444's first lines is misleading in one key respect. In the original clay document, the numbers of the lengths of reigns are given in SAR units using the numerical, numerical sign for 3,600. A Lumen's reign in a redo is not stated 28,800 years, but it's listed as eight shards or SARs here. Alaugar's reign was not 36,000 years, but 10 SARs, and so on down the list of pre-diluvial rulers. The SAR units in this prism are the very Saros of Barosis. Significantly, the SAR unit of reign applied only to the pre-diluvial rulers of the cities of the gods. The unit of count changes to regular numbers in the post-diluvial part of the document. No less significant is the fact that this list of rulers names the very same first five cities in the exact same order as does tablet CBS 10673. But rather than naming the gods whose cult center each city was, WB4444 lists the king's administrators of each such city. As a major study by William W. Hallow, the antediluvian cities was was established has established both documents, records, and a canonical a uh, canonical tradition of regarding the start of civilization kingship on Earth, beginning in Eridu and ending in Shuparak at the Deluge time. One cannot fail to note that WB four 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 does not mention the hero of the Deluge, Zisudra, among the eight kings it names. Embracing the cities and reigns from the start in Eridu to the diluvial finale in Shirapak, its list ends with Ubar Tutu and not with Zisudra. But as Tablet 6, I'm sorry, Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh clearly stated the hero of the deluge, Zisudra, was the last ruler of Shirapak, and he was the son and successor of Ubar Tutu. Various discoveries of other complete or fragmented similar tablets leave no doubt that a canonized text from which copies and copies of copies were made did exist in regard to the pre-diluvial cities of the gods and their rulers. And in the course of such copying, errors and omissions took place. One such little-known tablet is kept in a private collection in the Carpelli's Manuscript Library in Santa Barbara, California. It, too, names eight kings in five cities, but its different reign links add up to ten great sars, which equals only 22,600 years. Oh, only 22,000 years. So only 22,000 years as opposed to 241,000 years. Oh, it's off a little bit. <laughs> My God, you're still talking about somebody who ruled here for 200,000 plus years. You know, give or take uh, 20 or 40,000 years here or there. Okay, why is that a big deal? The glaring omissions of Zisidra are corrected in another tablet called by some scholars the Dynastic Chronicle. It lists nine kings in the first five cities, again with somewhat different SAR numbers. 
but correctly ending with two kings in Shurupuk, Ubar Tutu, and Zisudra. The tablet adds, after the total of five cities, nine kings, 98 sars, which equals 352,800 years. A brief explanation for the deluge in Lil took a, ma- a dislike to mankind. The clamor they made kept, kept him sleepless. The tablet that gives the most accurate list of ten rulers matching the Barosis list is the Ashmolean Museum's tablet WB62. Its SAR units for the pre-diluvial list parallel the the Soros units of Barosis, though with different individual rain periods. It differs from WB444 in listing not five but six cities, adding the city of Larsa, and with it, two rulers to the pre-diluvial list, resulting in the full ten rulers and ending correctly with Zesudra at deluge time. A comparison of WB-62 with the Greek fragments of Barosis points strongly to this version as his principal source. Which of the various tablets that we have reviewed is the most accurate? The one that ends in Shurupak and concludes Zesudra and his father predecessor is possibly the most reliable with them. The list has pre- ten pre-diluvial rulers in six cities of the gods. The Bible, too, lists ten pre-diluvial patriarchs, though all were descendants of Adam through his grandson Enosh, which is Hebrew for human, and not considered gods. The fact that they numbered ten, and that the hero of the, del- the, hero of the deluge, Noah, was like Zesudra, the tenth, Add support to the ten rulers count as the correct one. Despite the varying individual rain links, the various tablets unanimously agree that those successive rulers reigned from the kingship that was brought down from heaven until the deluge swept, o- swept there over. Oh, my goodness. See, that makes so much sense now. So so this kingship was brought down to heaven, to earth, until the deluge swept over. And what happened after the deluge swept over? Well, then it wasn't seen as being handed down from heaven anymore. And I believe that it's at this point when the bloodlines started to have significance um, as far as the you know, quote-unquote, divine right to rule and this passing down of hereditary dictatorships. Because after the deluge, as it states here, this, quote-unquote, brought down from uh, from heaven was wiped out. Because, again, as we talked about in other readings of Sitchin we've done in the past and other uh, stuff that we've read here, um, you know, they... they Later on, Anu was like, you know, what's what's going on with this? How come some of these survived, you know? And then he agreed to, you know, let them live after that, after so many of them survived. Assuming that Barosis had reported the most reliable version, we also end up with his total of 120 shars, which is 432,000 years, as the correct combined total of the pre-diluvial reigns. The time that had passed from when kingship was brought down from heaven until the deluge. Thus, if we could determine when the deluge had occurred, we would obtain the date when the Anunnaki had arrived on earth. Is that right? So if we obtain the date when the deluge had occurred, well, maybe we'll find that out before it's over with. Shit, some of this evidence may be in the rock wall thing. I mean, we've got the shale deposits there. We can date for a fact when this stuff started layering on top of this. I'll get us pretty close to a damn date. You watch. We get a dig going, I'll get a date for sure. That the number 120 appears in the biblical preamble to the tale of the deluge, the deluge might thus be more than a coincidence. The usual explanation that it represents a limit on human longevity set by God at the time of the deluge is a dubious explanation in view of the fact that the Bible itself reports right thereafter that Shem 
The eldest son of Noah lived after the deluge to the age of 600 years. His son, Arpachonshad, to 438, then Shalak to 433 years, and so on in descending longevities to 205 years for Terah, the father of Abraham, and Abraham himself lived to age 175. Moreover, a careful reading of the Hebrew, of Hebrew shows that Genesis 6-3 states, and his years were 120. Were, not will be. And his can be understood as referring to the deity's count in Sar years of his own presence on earth from arrival to Delhi.